Here, woo! I'm Hello. For this. I'm excited. <laughs> I've just got a good vibe to this open bar. I've got a good oh, feeling excellent. about this one. How, how you know, much it, alcohol have you had already? <laughs> quite a bit. I'm not gonna lie. This this was full when I started. <laughs> the answer drinker is not enough. That's what you're supposed to say. Never enough. There's never enough. But hey, there's always more room at the bar, as we like to say. Mm -hmm. um, but welcome, one and all. This is open bar number forty-one, and uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here as always. Yes. Um, we have got a lovely uh, panel tonight. We've got uh, Baggage Claim and we've got Despot of Antrim, uh, who's making his debut on this uh, on this live stream. So that should be lovely. And we've got a few nice things to talk about. So all good stuff, man. We do indeed. Uh, yeah. Um, so we'll bring in our first guest right damn now. It's <clears> Baggage <throat> Claim making our, her return after a few months away. Hello again. Hello. Cheers, boys. To... Hey, nice. <laughs> Cheers to you. Good to have you back again. So good to be back. I'm actually drinking during the op open bar, so I'm very excited about that. Excellent stuff, yeah. And it must be quite, quite early quiet, but appreciated. Well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> drinking at a two on a two p.m. on a Sunday. Oh no, sorry, on a Thursday. Yeah, it's all right. You know, it's past yeah. it's past midday, so you're okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. usually Weekends, all right. Yeah. Then. It is my yeah. birthday this weekend, so I can just. Oh well, a happy birthday in advance Thank then. Thank you so much. Nice. Um, yeah, we've got Despot of Antrim coming in as well. Um, he's just uh, going to be with us shortly. He's got to do a few things first, but uh, I guess we could just kick it off because we were so excited to get started. Plus, there was the small fact of like 3,000 people waiting for us to begin, so I guess it made sense to start. Hello! Because of the time change, too. I think people, because in we just had the clocks go forward, so I think because of the time change, people were expecting us to pop in. Like an hour earlier. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I think it's just like, what is it, another week or something before hours do that? Yeah. Two weeks. Two weeks, in fact. Yeah. We're all right. Well, yeah. Gotta, gotta go by host time, I guess. <laughs> like, so exactly. yes. The British people well, are like, everything's normal. The Americans are like, everything's broken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We we are uh, on Greenwich Mean Time, the prime meridian by which everything else is set. So it's yeah. the correct British way. <laughs> the empire gets the say. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We conquered half the world, so we we get <laughs> we get to dictate. <laughs> But yes, I was going to say, like, there's a few things we were going to cover tonight, but um, obviously we're just post Oscars as well, like, before we yeah. get into the rest of the stuff. And um, it feels like, uh, weirdly, it feels like an Oscars where I was relatively happy with how everything played out. You know, the um, everything everywhere all at once kind of cleared up in terms of mm -hmm. um, Oscar wins, uh, you know, best picture, best actress, best supporting actor, but uh, I feel like it was quite well deserved and it was a bit of a crowd pleaser, so... That yeah, yeah nice. no, I think so. It was nice to see. Good job. Uh, yeah. Love the movie. So, <laughs> this, mm. this, yeah, this is really the, good. This Oscars didn't piss me off really at all. I saw <laughs> the results and I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, thumbs up. All right. Well, it, it wasn't like obscure little movies that like you've never heard of and that were just clearly designed as Oscar bait. You know, like um, everything, everywhere, all at once was you know a relatively high profile picture. Like it got a lot mm -hmm. of attention and stuff, and it wasn't so. Um, so out there that like your average cinema goer just wasn't going to appreciate it. It was something you know pretty fun and pretty accessible um, yeah. with a with a quirky yeah. concept. You know, um, yeah. I just think it's funny that it came out at the same time as Multiverse of Madness, and it's like yeah. did, did the whole multiverse thing so much better. <laughs> why is that? Why does that happen? Why why do like two very similar movies come out around the same time? I don't know. Do it does know? happen, doesn't it? Because we had. Deep Impact and Armageddon came out around about the same time. We had, what was it, White House Down and Olympus, Olympus has, fallen, has Fallen, around about the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel it's too, if... too much to be a coincidence, isn't it? It's like it's got to be more than that. It's like, uh huh. Yeah. I, I, I mean, when you watch the films, there are night and day difference in terms of how they're executed. But just that multiversal part of it, you're just like, that's curious. Yeah. Hmm. Oh yeah, the um, Prestige and the Illusionist. They oh came out yes. Like, back in time. Oh yeah. That's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> But multi, yeah. I mean, I was about to call it multiverse. So, um, but everything, everywhere was. I, I thought it 
it wasn't that typical Oscar bait where it's like very on the note, very, you know, very elitist types of movies that seem to have been winning lately. It was actually a, a good movie that people liked, had a good story, um, had very interesting characters. For me, I, I enjoyed it because it was very similar to my family's story. You know, we moved here as immigrants and there's all this, you know, generationally, there's all this difference between what do the grandparents think? What do the parents think? And then how the kids are the ones who end up being ambassadors of what it means to be in this new culture. But you start to get this like split personality almost like, oh, you're one way in front of your parents and you're another way in front of your friends. And I thought like they captured stuff like that really well of like being caught in the middle, the mom's caught in the middle between two different generations and yeah mm -hmm. but it wasn't it wasn't like all you know sobby it was actually like very entertaining how it was done it was i thought it was a great movie i think yeah the fact that it had james hong in it as well it just makes it fundamentally oh, I always awesome. love him, yeah <laughs> it's just great you know it'll always be david lopan for me but uh <laughs> you know it's he's, he's the guy's about 95 years old or something and he's, yeah. he's still still going strong it's great stuff no um and... he's the he's the grandpa right yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think I always remember him from How I Met Your Mother. <laughs> mm. Well, he's in everything. <laughs> he's, he's, yeah. He's been, he's, he's, very. Honestly, um, his list of credits is insane. Like he's been in mm -hmm. so many films over the years. Very accomplished voice actor too. Uh, he just pops oh, really? up everywhere. He's uh, he's Poe's dad in Kung Fu Panda. I remember oh. thinking like, oh, I recognize that voice. And you often do. He, he just pops up in loads of different animated things. That's pretty Which, cool. Uh, it's a really great voice. Um, Can we talk about Banshees? Sure, we can. What did you guys think? <laughs> what did you guys think? I thought it was good. <laughs> I just, um, I don't know. Uh, so I'm a huge fan of In Bruges and Seven Psychopaths. Um, I thought Three Billboards was kind of fine. Uh, it didn't quite connect with it. And this movie, uh, this coverage of it on Capital O Opinions' channel with me, Rags, and Bringy, I just didn't quite connect with it. I think I understood it for the most part. Um, and I laughed here and there. And I thought the acting was really good. But didn't quite vibe with the story. That's all. But I'm um, happy to celebrate it being a strong entry, though. Yeah, I felt I because I thought the acting was great, I, but I just couldn't. I couldn't get into it. I just felt like finger cutting over something like that. I was just like every time there was a finger being cut, I'm like, what the fuck? What the hell is going on? Yeah, yeah, that was a bit too far for me. And Tim's just like, oh, we, it, I thought it was grounded, and then that happened. I was like, really? <laughs> Did you actually cut your fingers off? And he went from four, one, cutting off one to four, yeah. to a donkey That's... choking, to a house being burnt on, like, on fire. I was like, well, he said he'd do it? it, as someone in chat just said. So, you man know, of his man word. of his word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you seen it yet, Drinker? Or? I haven't yet. No. Um, oh, yeah, I've been working my way through the Oscar. It. Oh, it's fine, you know. It's it's one of those films where I'd heard kind of mixed things about it, and one of my friends like, like I asked him to describe the plot, and it's just like two guys fall out, and the other one one of them tries to get the other one to make up or to him, um, or like forgive him, and it like that's basically the plot of the movie. Um, and I was like, yeah. okay, cool. Mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't sound yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, but then again, it's like. You know, if you said to me, like, oh, there's a story about a really fat guy who lives, in, like, alone in his apartment and eventually <clears> just <throat> dies from, from being obese, um, I wouldn't have said that was a great plot for a movie either. But then, you know, it turned out to be a pretty, pretty nice, pretty nice story. Pretty awesome stuff. Um, so, yeah. you know, it's, uh, I guess you can't always judge it just by its synopsis. I quite love the whale. Um, I thought it was a crazy <laughs> film, though. Like just just the whole thing. But like I I do think as much as I think uh, Sadie Sink and um, the actress that was nominated for supporting as well, I think they put in good performances. I don't think that film will be anywhere near as good as it is without Brandon Fraser, which is really cool yes. to be able to say. I, I um, think uh, yeah, it's a great example of a, an actor's performance elevating what's probably quite an, an average script because. Really, it's it's not like a complex plot or anything, and it, the mm. dialogue's fine. It's just it's not like outstanding or anything. It's just the sheer like like conviction that he puts into it, the whole performance. Mm. You know, it's compelling stuff. I think yeah. up to a certain point, I was like, he's good, he's good, yeah, he's good. It was when he he says that line to the uh, the ex wife as she's leaving, the line about oh, yeah. uh, his life having meaning. I was like, oh, this is great. <laughs> that, oh, yes. that was that was that great. Was yeah. yeah. Um, but I, 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 I struggled with, you know, the, the daughter's character, obviously, because 
the thesis, I would say like the thesis of the movie is that everybody is kind, kind of like everybody's capable of kindness. And that's what he can see despite being through so much, you know, tragedy. And that if, despite his daughter spewing absolute hatred at him, he's able to see that she's capable of so much good. I, I, I guess so. Like, it was an interesting one with her character because, like I mentioned in my review just today that I put out, um, it's not like they have this kind of traditional relationship that you might expect in a film like this where there's a bit of initial resistance, but they gradually bond and they become friends. And then there's yeah. like, um, th you know, his health starts to take a decline and she's like there by his bedside, like as he's dying. Um, you know, it's it's much more adversarial and they don't really mm. have a, a proper reconciliation. It's more like she just gets to air her her true emotions to him. You know, she, yeah. she finally has that moment where she's like, uh, she becomes like almost like a, a sad little girl who's sad, who's... Um, you know, feeling lost because her father abandoned her and all exactly, those emotions yeah. come to the surface. Like it's everything yeah. else is just kind of a smoke screen for her. Um, and that's just a moment of honesty. It's exactly like what he asked for from his students, you know, yeah. just write me something fucking honest oh, for nice. once in your lives. And that's all we wanted from his daughter as well. And that's what he gets. So I guess in that sense, he got through to her. Um, but yeah, it's not it's not like a perfect resolution because that's not what life is, I suppose. Um, right. Yeah, you wanted to. It seemed like you wanted to save her to some degree, get through to mm. it before you ran out of time. Yeah, um, and like you know, in, indirectly, like he's the reason that she is the way she is. That she's so embittered. That she's so angry. That she's so self destructive because of him abandoning her. You know, right. that's that's him. He's yeah. the guy who caused that because of all the the selfish decisions that he made. Um, right. But I was going to ask as well, like, th there's a moment where she, you know, there's that Christian missionary who comes in and, like, she gets him to smoke pot and she takes photographs mm -hmm. of him and she ends up sending it to his parents. Like, do you think she knew that that was ultimately going to result in a, a good um, homecoming for him, like, that his parents would forgive him? Or was she literally just doing that to fuck with him uh, and, and, you know, oh. try and ruin him? Like, was, it, was that unexpected for her? Because so like, Brendan Fraser we... acts as if, like, yeah, oh, she did it for good reasons. She, good she's reason. a good person. Mm -hmm. But, like, I don't know if she really did. Most people I talk to believe she did it maliciously. Um, I'm not sure what to take away from the film. Because <clears throat> you can argue the film is saying, hey, I don't know. Make up yourself. And that the character Brendan Fraser playing believes that she did it for good reasons. But some people think, like, no, I'm pretty sure the movie thinks she did it for good reasons, right? And it's, like, it's hard to say. It's, mm. it's, it, it's, it's really hard to pinpoint exactly. Um... I think yeah. I ended up agreeing with the people I was on a panel with that it seems like she did that to hurt him. Hmm. Seems like it. It seems more than likely. Like the idea that she thought, I know, I'll tell his parents that this is what he thinks and that'll reconnect them. Doesn't seem that likely, but I guess maybe. Um, I can, <clears throat> I can part maybe of what, make the arg Sorry, on you go. I'll just be really quick. Part of what I drew from it was that he was using that as a motivation to do everything he could to save her, to say everything he could to her, to bring her. And then, of course, right at the end, he actually gets through. Um, yeah. So, you know, like, he chooses to see a lot of her actions in a better light. If you remember, I don't think it's ever explicitly answered. She was the one that broke the plate that the birds were eating from, right? They have That's a shot question, showing actually. it, and he sees it, and he's like, what the hell? And it's like, yeah, I assume yeah. she did that. Because uh, she was I, shown staring at it last. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, I would go as far as saying maybe an interpretation is that she's malicious throughout the film until right at the end. And it's just that he kept trying to believe in her no matter what. I, I think you could definitely interpret it that way. I, I kind of always, I almost saw the, the plate and the bird and stuff is just like symbolic of him trying to like repair his relationship with his daughter and when it's smashed, like I think that comes at the low point of the movie where like mm -hmm. everyone's kind of abandoned him and it's just meant to represent the shattered pieces of his life or something, but... Yeah, I could totally buy that she broke it just to piss him off. Um, yeah. I, I think when it comes to, you know, her sending that that picture to the missionary's parents, um, I almost took it as, like, she just wants them to see him as he is, just honesty, which is kind of what Charlie wants from her and from everyone else, just honesty. Yeah. Um, but, you know, letting go of the pretenses and stuff. So uh, I guess... Uh, there's, there's kind of a lot to chew over with that movie, and there's a lot that's, to some extent, left open to your interpretation. Um, well, because what you were just fine, saying, I like that. 
It reflects um he never got to live honestly, right? Like he wanted a kid and so the, his wife accuses him of only having gotten with her to have a child of his own sort of thing when yeah, really he yeah. wanted to be with another man. And so mm -hmm. uh and then he lost that partner and so it just spiraled into everything. So yeah, it, there's like a core of he just wanted to live as who he was, but he never got that chance or at yep. least he didn't give himself the right pathway to do so. To do um, so. Yeah. Yeah. But I did think so, I did think she was very vindictive, but didn't I? But didn't realize that she could. She, there was like a part of her that was more innocent, even in that vindictiveness, right? That mm -hmm. at one point she does say to him, like, "Yeah, you're hideous." Like I, I couldn't believe the things she was saying to him. Right? He's clearly almost dying. She obviously doesn't know that yet, but she's she's so vindictive. But at the same time. It's like he is killing himself. He is dying with yeah. what he has done to himself. She's just being honest about what's really going on. But that, but does she need to post a photo of her father on Facebook? That's that really cruel side to her that doesn't mm -hmm. know what to do with itself. It doesn't know how to be useful in the world. It just knows how to be destructive, and that's it. Yeah, she's uh, she's a broken person because she was abandoned by her father, like Drinker said, and that he feels like immense guilt for it. Yeah. And you can tell as well by the time you hit that, that like, throughout the film, almost every character tells him, it's like, go to hospital, pay for blah, blah, blah. And like, everyone tells him, he keeps saying no. He's a very self-destructive person as well. And right. So it's obviously fed into her significantly. Could you, um, I mean, could you make the argument that he was like literally trying to kill himself? I think so, yeah. Because... I, I, you could t you could go either way with it because there's times when you see him like researching you know um, congenital heart um, you know defect or whatever it is like that he's got like um, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that he's he's dying of heart disease and he seems genuinely like you know upset and and unhappy at the fact that he's uh, probably going to die so I was like oh like does that mean he wants to live he just can't stop eating or could you interpret it as he he's a broken man who's made so many mistakes in life he's intending to basically pass away and all the money that he's got goes to his daughter so that he's done something good with his life i, think I don't know so, yeah. like, you know i think that money going to her is the last thing he can think he did right that's why he won't allow the money to be spent on himself yeah yeah and you know his i i, I think i got this right was that the his boyfriend stopped eating and that's yes. why he passed away so that this almost this desire to overfeed himself coming, you know, I don't, I don't know. I kind of saw that as a, as the reason that he was taking so much solid solitude in just feeding himself. Those moments where he was like eating, just binging was just so intense. The music was incredible, but then it's, you're just watching him like gorge himself. It's, it's like almost sinister music. Like it's yeah. really horrific. Like it actually kind of put me off food for like the rest of the day. <laughs> I was like, um, oh God, this is awful. I'm assuming you guys are aware, but there are people who tweet about how Brendan Fraser has attacked the fat community with this film. He has oh. shamed yeah. them. Oh, <laughs> the, the first thought everyone was like, fat <clears throat> community? Fat community? Like well, what? They, <laughs> yeah, well, they, they did they, bring they... up the fact that it's actually bad for your health to be that overweight. So yeah. that itself well, is an attack. I saw people on Twitter talking about how like they're a marginalized group and stuff. It's like, oh, get fucked! Like, <laughs> you, you. It's not like you're a racial minority or it's your, you know, you're a different sexuality or anything like that. Like, those are things you're born with. You fucking chose to be like this, okay? Like, that's that's not a marginalized community. That wasn't beyond your control. So don't play the victim with that one. And also, yeah. like, you know. Yeah, like the movie <laughs> makes the point that like weighing six hundred pounds is really unhealthy and dangerous for you. Like in other news, water is wet. You know, it, it's like it should be self evident. Like that that's that's uh, something that you shouldn't even need to teach people. There's that. But yeah, like yeah. some of the criticism I saw was like, oh my god, like he's he's, you know, a, a character like this is portrayed as fundamentally like. Uh, broken and unhappy and and all the rest. It's like, well, who at that size is happy with their themselves? Yeah, not many, I would imagine. Oh, no, that's, I, that's not, I think that's part of why they made him as heavy as that. I think he's like five hundred to six hundred pounds, possibly yeah. more. Um, yeah. The whole point is that it, it just destroys quality of life in every aspect. Well, if you like, can't even walk across the room because of how big you are, then I would, yeah, I would argue you probably ruined your life. Like that's. 
Yeah, yeah and, and come back from. A lot of people are like, he's not even that weight. You need to hire people who are that weight in order. And it's just like, what? <laughs> like, and as someone pointed uh, out, I was like, do you know how dangerous that would be? Being like, yeah. all these hard hours to record this film. Like, you got to get here right now, fat guy who's like 700 pounds. Like, <laughs> no. You might not no. even make it through the film. That's, you know, and it might even encourage these actors who, you know, say you're like, a, a, a svelte 400 pounds you know like yeah. you, you might almost be like oh i need to get bigger for this role and it's like eating more food and getting fatter you know like yeah that's that's literally going to destroy people's love, lives you can't do that to someone the idea that like a 400 yeah. 500 pound person is considered thin in that community yeah. <laughs> look at this sportsman running around <laughs> <laughs> I bet you can fit your car, you piece of shit. Like... <laughs> you only need one airline seat, you know? <laughs> Someone did make a TikTok saying that I have thin privilege, even though she was a bigger girl. She was like, I have thin privilege because I don't need to buy an additional uh, you know, seat at, on a flight. So compared to someone who does, I'm privileged and that person's not. It's just, there's all these, these like delineation of how privileged a person is. That That's, yeah. I like totally like I can I can listen at least to the argument of like you know um being a gen a certain gender or sexuality or having a certain skin color might make life harder for you in certain places okay fine you can have that conversation but like nobody made you be 600 pounds like that's that's on you and so yeah you can't claim privilege there uh, or or oppression yeah um, as, as Ricky Gervais said like it's not a disease you just like eating. <laughs> like, <that's, laughs> and hey, you know, we all understand eating's pretty cool. It is. Yeah. It is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, you know, I, li I like a pizza as much as the next guy, but I would <laughs> eat five of them a day. And like, if I if my jeans started to get tight, you know, I would just like cut down a little bit or I'd do more walking or whatever. I wouldn't buy bigger jeans. Like that's... Only five, huh? Good, okay. Yeah. <laughs> have, you guys, have you guys ever watched mukbangs where people gorge oh, no. themselves oh, and a ton of God food. Awful. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, it's interesting because it's like, okay, first first time in his in like the history of human existence that food is this ubiquitous that you can like literally access so many calories at a very low price. It's never happened before. And mm. so I I so of course like eating disorders are through the roof because we're not really programmed to control how much we eat. I mean we can, but we're not we're programmed to crave more calories, right? Um, so I really think that mukbangs are like the new porn. It's like the new porn for food because people are just like the deep, dark desire is to eat as much as possible for some people. I, I think uh, I used to quite enjoy Epic Meal Time. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's same deal, you know, it's just like cooking insanely big like hamburgers or whatever it might be. Um, and it's kind of cool just from the spectacle point of view. But yeah, like, like you say, um, I... I in in different centuries like being fatter was considered mm -hmm. like a sign of status because you could afford food yeah you know and it, it's different now because like you say it's it's ubiquitous you can go out anywhere and get fast food like really cheap and become huge um and that's why i guess society now kind of prizes um people who are not thinner but like in better shape because they've got the self-discipline to like um curb that to work at it yeah yeah yeah, but so much of the fat community's argument is that, oh, it's genetic, and you didn't ha you didn't go through this, or you you have thin privilege, and you have this, and it's like, oh, that if I'm fat, it's not actually my fault, and it's not in my control. So, it's it's this con, it's that consistent, it's consistent with this thing of saying I'm a victim of society, and that's why I'm going to eat, and that's okay, and you guys should actually accept that. Yeah, I think it's interesting that this genetic defect only ever occurred when uh, McDonald's came to be. So, you know, <laughs> what are the odds, eh? God, strange stuff. <laughs> the evolution of the Happy Meal. It is, and it's just, you know, it's, for, for any rational person, it's just obvious. It's like, look, you know, it's really easy to get junk food these days, and if you're not disciplined with it, you will gain weight quite easily you know because most of our jobs require us to sit on our arses and type at a computer as well like for, for the yeah. average person so again it doesn't really uh inspire lots of exercise that burns off loads of calories and so the result is people gain weight it's it's unfortunate but it's just reality and so you you either have to work out and, and burn off that excess energy or you have to like cut down what you're eating but like people don't do it and it's like yeah well you know donuts are nice so i want to eat loads of donuts and it's 
you know, it's not my thing if I get fat. <laughs> now more than ever, there is nutritional information up the wazoo all over the internet. It'll tell you everything about how it's like, you know that hamburger? It's much worse than you thought, even. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't need to look at the the calorie count on a deep-fried Mars bar to know that, like, that's, that's probably going to be bad for me. I shouldn't. Oh, eat just that. eat a banana with it and you'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll have a little piece of lettuce on top of it or something. Yeah, like, then you're great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, look, I know we deviated off course there a little bit, but with the, with the Oscars, yeah, it seemed to have passed without incident this year. I was relatively happy with, with whoever won. There didn't seem to be as many like self-aggrandizing, like politically motivated speeches either. I don't know if they... They had a word with people behind the scenes or what but it just felt like it was a bit more restrained than it'd been yeah. in previous so, years as usual it's i just nasty. looked at the results i didn't actually watch it because i'm not crazy <laughs> like, but... I, I watched i watched some of the acceptance speeches and it seemed mm -hmm. to be more just about like thanking you know oh, family and agents yeah and i watched i watched brandon's acceptance speech he's adorable yeah, actually <laughs> yeah. that was a great acceptance speech but even I, I thought even Jimmy Kimmel did a good job and you know kind of called out what had happened last year with, with the Will Smith slap and you know he got his criticisms but whatever I'll I think say he did a good job. That's as much as that's funny. It's like the most obvious thing to do, right? Like yeah. any yeah. comedian going up there, you have to talk about the slap, otherwise yeah. you'll almost be seen as cowardly at that point. I don't know if you guys have seen Chris Rock talking about it recently. Oh. That was yeah. amazing. It's interesting that he waited an entire year to like that's the thing. make a statement about this. It's like why not just like hit back right away, you know? Yo, that's no, the, I thought everyone's... that was perfect. It makes me wonder though, like, did he, did he wait until it was like clear as a safe thing to do PR wise? No, like, I think if you I think if something like that happens to you, first of all, it's so embarrassing. But I think waiting an entire year where people are dying to know what you have to say, but instead he leveraged it into this multi-million dollar contract with Netflix and then just dunks on him. It was, it was so intelligent. It was us taking monetize your haters to the next level, isn't it? Yeah, but it was <laughs> like, like a he, Netflix show. Yeah, like, but you know, someone else might have gone and like sat on Oprah or something about it, right? Or released something on Instagram, but instead he was just like dead quiet about it, went on. And, and instead got this like huge deal. I mean, you know, I, I, however long he took to come out with it, like I fully agree with his sentiments on it. Yeah. When he's just like, he's talking about Will Smith and it's like, yeah, we've all been cheated on in this audience. You know, you've probably all had someone <laughs> cheat on you at some point, but you've never had your, your boyfriend or girlfriend like interview <laughs> you <laughs> about <laughs> being cheated on. Like, how did you feel about it and stuff like that is next level messed up. Like, I, I do not understand how Will Smith, like, puts up with that shit. Yeah. Like, that, that, is a, that is a Californian marriage going on right there. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah. I, I, but that's what he, they did. Is like, it's so crazy that your wife would cheat on you, and then you guys sit and talk about it. And she's like, how did you, that make you feel when I did that to yeah. you? It's you like, well, online. take a guess. Your options are angry, pissed off, and raging. Like, which one do you want to pick there? <laughs> yeah. Like, but yeah, and it's the fact that it was, like, with a friend of his son, was it? Oh, yeah. Yes, friend of his son's. Like, I mean, I, I, I'm just saying, man, like, if if you'd flip the genders on this one and it was Will Smith, like, dating one of his daughters or cheating on his wife with one of his daughter's friends, like, what would the reaction have been to that? Oh, you know, pilloried at the stake for sure. It's yeah, yeah. It's, it's weird stuff, but um, yeah, it's um, it, it's the, not the done many favors. Weird. Yeah, I mean, and his is his career going to recover from that? It, it's funny. Well, he did it like a total Oscar bait and film, didn't he? Like, what was right. it called like Emancipation or something? Emancipation. Yeah, it's just like, oh, I need to do something that will boost up my creds. Like, oh, what can I do? Like, some kind of slavery-related thing, whatever. <laughs> like, yeah, Chris Rock's joke about that it was so good. Yeah, I love the the joke of like you know if you gotta slap someone, don't you worry, you'll be awarded best actor or whatever. <laughs> like, yeah. No, but then he made a joke. He was like, I was I was um, rooting for the master in, in Emancipation. <laughs> yeah. I was really, like really upset with him about that joke. It's good though. That's like that's what you should be like provocative as a comedian. Exactly. You know? I remember exactly. when they were allowed to do that. It's uh, it's pretty rare these days. It really is. Yeah, Miss Ricky Gervais um, on that front for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's, he can get away with it. Like, and same with like Chris Rock. Like, they're big enough that they can't really be cancelled as such. You know, they're always going to have an audience, and so they can kind of speak their minds. But like so many other comedians who are like at a lower level, they could just be like banned from gigs, and that's them. Like their career's done, basically. Right. So it's it's kind of scary times that we live in for comedians. Like, um, yeah, like their their options are getting narrower and narrower. I think. Yeah. Um, and it's only going to get worse. I mean, that's why the trigonometry guys are doing what they're doing, right? Like, because they started to see that, that they couldn't even work as comedians anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So, but like, swing chat. Man, I just spilled my spaghetti on my new carpet clicking the video. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It was a worthwhile sacrifice. Yeah. Hurry, five second rule. Yeah. 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 You're fine. You know? <laughs> it's got some lint on it. It's fine. You know, it just adds to the flavor. Um, but hey, like, you know, this Oscar chat is good. And like, I've, uh, I've enjoyed being able to review good stuff recently. It's been a crazy change of pace, like instead of mm. wading through like Marvel sludge or whatever, but uh, you still had to wade through a little Marvel sludge. Duty, yeah. yeah, duty calls, sadly. <laughs> and well, there is good news on the horizon, I will say because uh, Willow has been cancelled, tragically, Yay. after one season. <laughs> um legit one of the worst fantasy shows i've ever seen in my entire life like Hard that to was watch. disastrous you uh, you even messaged me more where i think said like are you going to make me watch the whole season <laughs> this, is really, this is really hard to the watch sacrifices for work yeah yeah totally i was uh almost completely out when that old dude died in the first episode i was just like nobody cared about him nobody gave a shit he was just this good man who dies for no reason at all then it's like a comedy beat where they move on i was just like Fuck, I hate stuff. <laughs> like, this I, is going to yeah. be horrible. I hate modern writing. And so, yeah, like, Willow's been cancelled. Star Trek Discovery has been cancelled. Um, I think, you know, <laughs> I will say about Star Trek Discovery as well, the amount of people trying to simp for this show on, on Twitter was just absolutely hilarious. Like, you know, this... We should be so thankful to this show because it's given us so many amazing Star Trek properties, like... You know, Lower Decks or yeah. Strange New Worlds or or Picard. Mm. Um, and it's like they were all garbage. Like Picard's pick, pulled it back in season three, but that's that's really all you've got. Like everything else has been kind of shit. So we don't really have to thank it for anything. Um, but it's it's interesting, right? Because we've got these two shows already that have been cancelled. I think there's going to be more on the horizon. I think this could be the beginning of a, a bit of a, a domino effect with shows that have been kind of shitty. Um, <clears throat> most of them are quite politically charged as well. Like they're very infused with the message. Mm. And I think they've kind of reached the end of their road in a lot of cases because most of them are quite expensive to make and they are not generating profits in the slightest. Uh, it's a weird situation we're in right now because it's hard to keep track of all the patterns, right? Because it, it makes more sense to just be like, everything still sucks, moving on. It's like, right. well, you know, have a look really like at everything and the quality of everything and who's getting to write, who's getting to direct and what shows being cancelled or maintained or things that they... The amount of Star Wars movies, man, that's one of the most interesting histories right now from Rise of Skywalker onward. It's like, what is going on with Star Wars? That yeah. There could be a book written about that, I think, at this point. Well, what we're getting now, right, is... <laughs> You know when, um, I don't know, how, what can I liken this to, like, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, where mm -hmm. it's like, well, you can arrange them into any crazy pattern you want now because the ship's about to sink, so, like, do what you mm -hmm. want, and, like, they, they could produce something genuinely amazing with those deck chairs, and that's kind of what it feels like with all these different franchises, like, for example, with, um, with Star Trek, um, Discovery, absolute dog shit. Strange New Worlds, I think it started out promising but ended up being shit. Lower Decks, no one cares about. Picard, first two seasons were absolute garbage. They, they, it's almost like, well, we don't care about this anymore. It's kind of dying anyway. We handed it off to some other guy who took it on and did a really good job with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. You know, season three has been pretty good. And, you know, I'll say, like, wait till you get to the end of it. But, um... Mm. It's like no one cares because it, it's like buried under un, underneath all this other crap. Um, and it's like nobody is going to come into a, a, a show three seasons in 
that's been crap up until now and say, well, I'm going to give it a chance at this point. Like, as much as I would like them to, I just don't think it's going to happen. And so um, the, you had that. You've also got um, Andor on, in the Star Wars universe, which is just like a completely different show made by a completely different creative team from anything else that they made. Like, I yeah. think we've all seen it and, well, Mauler and I have seen it and we've remarked upon how how well produced it is, how mm -hmm. well thought out it is. Um, but again, it's one show buried in, beneath all these other crappy shows and nobody's going to care about it. So it's like they, they trust um, or they give over these things to, to like actual competent people the, the stuff that doesn't really matter, that's like you can afford to take a chance on it. And that's the stuff that ends up being actually quite good because mm -hmm. it's made by people who care about it. But it doesn't matter because it's uh, it's so obscure and it's buried beneath so much other stuff that it's not going to make a difference in the grand scheme of things. That's the problem yeah. that we face. And everything, nothing's also made, at least in, in these situations, made as a standalone show. It's always meant to feed this other universe. So even something like, Man, you know, The Mandalorian started off so good. And now it's kind of like floundering and all over the place because it needed to feed into Boba Fett and needs to feed into other things. Like everything is, has some infusion of a, like, like corruption from other terrible media as well. Yeah. I just think that the, the, the sort of veil is being lifted gradually on Mandalorian. They can only get away with being cool for so long and cute, cool and cute. That's what mm -hmm. they've got going for them, right? That's the combo. But uh, especially, a lot of people got really pissed off by uh, them resetting after developing. Nobody likes it when you do that in a show. When it's like, look, everybody, progress. And you're like, ooh, ooh. And then they go, ha, nah, nah. <laughs> 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 you're like, hmm. It's, oh, God, I know so many people who are just waiting for those bounty hunting episodes. And it's like, you're never going to get it. You're already going to get this weird version where weird things happen on the video game quests. <laughs> Um, Side but, yeah, quest. like, but I mean, like, mentioning the the point I was making earlier is like these are the like two of the higher profile cancellations that we've had. I think there's going to mm -hmm. be a lot more coming. Um, I think um, obviously Discovery's done. Picard's going to be finished um, after this third season. They're not going to do another one. I think oh. um, Strange New Worlds is is going to end as well because I don't think it's getting anywhere near the viewers that they need. Um, I'd be kind of surprised if Andor gets another season, but it might. I don't know. Um, but it, it just feels like a lot of these things are ending, and I wouldn't be surprised if this filters over to the Marvel side of things because yeah, I know they've Bob Iger's made statements about this just recently, saying like we need to slow down the the rate of like Marvel production. <laughs> we need to slow down the rate of shit that we're piling yeah, out. like we can only we can only pump so much garbage through our our sludge pipe and yeah. um it's getting clogged up with shit right now and um yeah like a lot of these like more obscure shows like i think echo is right on that chopping block i think um harkness like agatha harkness could be mm. in trouble as well just these these shows that they know nobody's really going to care about but probably cost quite a bit to make i can see that yeah. getting cut yeah. yeah, because they could make anything uh, for a certain amount of time, and they're, they're nearly out of that era now. They can't just make anything anymore. Right. Well, look um, at Ant-Man. Ant-Man 3, yeah. right? Um, that that had theoretically everything going for it. It was the first movie in Phase 5. Um, there was no pandemic anymore. There was nothing to hide behind. There was no reason people wouldn't go to the, the theaters to see it. I don't think there was even much in the way of competition at the no. time. Uh, and yet... It's it's not even going to make five hundred million. I don't think um, it's going to lose money for the studio. That is unprecedented for Marvel. Uh, it's one thing to to um, have things like Black Widow, you know, kind of flop because it was the middle of the pandemic. It was released day and date yeah. on uh, on streaming. So fine, like that's that's a special case. But this is like everything should have been in place for it. Nobody was going to see it. One because it's a garbage movie, and two people are just like over it. And I think that's that's going to send like a, a real shockwave through the entire franchise. Yeah. So um, remember when Baby Yoda ate a pack of strange blue macaroons, and then they sold twelve packs of plain tasting blue macaroons for fifty dollars. <laughs> Damn. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, the, 
that's just them trying to make up for the fact. You guys remember when season one came out and they didn't have any merch ready? It was yeah. like a disaster. Everyone was like, buy Baby Yoda, buy Baby Yoda. And it's like, we don't have any. And then people had to make custom ones and they started selling on like eBay or whatever else, Etsy. And then eventually they were like, oh, fuck, we need to get... We need to get <laughs> it's just like, Missing out on right. millions. How did you yep. think of that? Like, yeah. it's, it's like, like the company that merchandises everything didn't think of that. That's kind of surprising. Yeah. Like yeah. Star Wars was predicated on merchandise. That's like George Lucas made his billions. It was just mm -hmm. like I've got the merchandise rights. So yeah, we're gonna have Ewoks, which are basically just walking teddy bears, of course, because like everyone's gonna buy them. Everyone wants to have like every kid wanted a Millennium Falcon. You know, all that stuff. Just yeah. Yeah. Like why wouldn't you think of that? And you've made like the most cutesy, um, likable character that you could design in a lab. Uh, yeah, why wouldn't you have toys of him ready to go? Yeah. yeah, it was such a mistake. But speaking yeah. of Ant Man, you know, at least before the, when Ant Man was coming out, it was leading up to Endgame, right? It, like everybody assumed it was going to be part of that bigger story. But I like I've just never felt like Ant Man's that strong of a character. He's like he just says kind of funny things and like he's not. He, I just don't. Paul Rudd's great, but I just never thought that the character was that compelling. So I he's completely not, no. see that no. like completely flopping. Yeah. You know, he's, he's just like a kind of like not a sidekick character, but he's like a, yeah. a B or a C tier like. I feel like they never hero. really figured out exactly what they wanted to do with him. Kind of feels like he's because the they, funny had, the, thing they is, had the right idea in the first movie, where it's like a yeah. heist movie, like you know, there's mm. a bunch of like misfit criminals like coming together to like use their skills to like steal stuff from a lab or whatever. Eh, great, you know, I can I can get behind that. Out of curiosity, what do you think Quantumania would have done if it came out between Infinity War and Endgame in terms of box office? Uh, probably like 800 million. I think it would have made over Easily. a billion if Captain Marvel could. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> it's like that's the and base that like shit. <laughs> it's like if Captain Marvel can make a billion, anything can. <laughs> anything can. <laughs> I mean, all they needed to do was show her logo at the end of Infinity, and that's that's what did it. That's what drove so many people to that movie. Well, let me and ask you. That was the like... power of that story. Well, I mean, as, as a woman, like, how pumped are you for uh, for the Marvels? <laughs> like, how so are you? Pumped. Yeah, <laughs> I thought so. Pumped. No, no, no. I'm really sick of this. I'm really sick of uh, of the women being terrible and having every license to do so and every excuse in the book to be ex as as terrible as possible. I just and, and it's like whether they're like mistreating people or like you know like we've seen with with wanda whatever she's done in in um what was that show called wanda vision mm -hmm. everything is just yeah. kind of an excuse and then like people will just bring up well, well fuck men so we can do whatever we want that's cool that, that was pretty much the ethos behind uh, she hulk i suspect as well yeah um, i mean that right. the whole empower thing trying even to think about using Wanda as an example of like an empowering female, <laughs> I can't. I, like that. That's the kind of shit where you're just like, no, you joke it. It's like, no, they did it. Yeah. They actually did it. And I liked Wanda. Like she was one of my favorite characters after Endgame. I just I loved everything that had happened with her. And then mm -hmm. they just like destroyed her. They made her so terrible. And then continuously, and I mean, even everything she did in. Um, in multiverse and then like dr strange just like what you know you're justified it's okay please don't cancel me <laughs> yeah I, I think um, i could have still got behind wanda if she'd faced consequences of her actions like if yeah. uh, she'd really been called to, to task for what she did in one division it's like well mm -hmm. okay there's consequences to what you did and like you're a flawed person okay fine you know, maybe yeah. even you're you feel genuine remorse about that, and you're trying to make amends, but you're still getting pulled down this dark path because you want, you know, this this life that you've saw a glimpse of. You know, there's something you can do there. Like we we can all get behind yeah. flawed characters, yeah. for sure. But like if you're if you're so terrified of criticizing a character just because they're female, uh, and so you have to say like, well. Yeah, you uh, you put everything right, so it's fine. Like you know, everything's everything's good. You're still an awesome person. Yeah. Um, you know, and then oh, you're you're going evil again. Well, what can we do? You know, <laughs> well, she's coming back. We all know that. 
Well, oh, I, I mean, fine, yeah. okay, the stuff she did in Mondovision, fine. Um, but it was so much worse what she did in Multiverse. She was, yes. she was like mass murdering, like crazy. <laughs> yeah. And she killed so, Professor X. She broke his neck. <laughs> yes. I mean, she, she killed, she also killed a lot of ethnic characters. Apparently, that's not okay today. So, but she's still going to come back as like, as you know, the female empowered woman. So, which just sucks. It's like she was such a great, complex character that she did start off in Ultron. She started off as the bad person, right? And then she transformed. And then there's all this pain that she carries and what she tries to do with it. And there's all this power in that. Like, but then it's just, and now they just turned her into, into justified destruction person. Yeah, I think um, the, the the rationale seems to be behind it. Like, well, one, if you're female, two, if you're a person of color, and, and three, like, uh, if you've got a sad story, then you can kind of get away with whatever you want because, yeah. like, that that's fine. And it's, one, it's really disrespectful to, to anyone who falls into any of those categories. And two, it's, uh, it, re it leads to a very dishonest story. Yeah. Because it's like you're you're trying to like just ignore morality for the sake of like just not offending people. And it's such a terrible way to make movies. Right. Yeah. And coming the, back to Miss Marvel. Oh sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say it's the two halves of it, right? It's why she does the things and what things does she do, and they were both mm -hmm. absolutely unreal. I never believed that they would actually take it that way in MOM. Just yeah, that's all. Totally agree. Yeah, but going back to Miss Marvel. You know, it just shows. I, I, I think Brie Larson is just not capable of being the lead of another movie just by herself. So they have to do it, you know, with with two replications of her. But both the other characters, they don't. She, Brie Larson's character, probably has the most amount of personality out of the other two, and that's not saying much, though. Yeah, I mean, um, um, I never watched Ms. Marvel. Like I watched like the first episode or two with Az. Yeah, you watched more than you get into. Yeah, and I just didn't really care about it. Like I think the actress yeah. is fine. Like she seems like a nice enough like person. Mm -hmm. Um, so like there is that, but then when it comes to like uh, Monica Rambo, uh, I, I to the, for the life of me, I don't understand what her powers are or how she got them. She just kind of walked through like the portal in WandaVision and suddenly she's a superhero now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's bizarre. The jelly um, person. She's she's a jelly person, yeah. Bullets just pass through her. Why? I don't know, I don't what, know. What, what that has to do with anything, but that is her power or one of her powers. I don't know. Yeah, why not? Why not? <laughs> but, um, you've got that, but then none of these characters have interacted with each other before um, on screen, and so you've, you're throwing them all together into one movie and just expecting them to have great chemistry for it to be really cool and funny and interesting. And I just think. Um, you're you're shooting for the stars there, and I just don't think you're going to get anywhere near it. Um, particularly, yeah, I guess when you've got when you've got Brie Larson as the centerpiece of it. Like, I don't know, I don't know what she's like in real life. Maybe she's like amazing, but uh, yeah, like based on the interviews that I've seen her do with the other Avengers and stuff, like yeah, it looks pretty pretty shaky. Um, yeah. And I think there's a reason that film has been delayed like five times already. It's because yeah. they know they've got an absolute stinker on their hands and they're trying to fix it, but there's only so much they can do. That's right. Yeah, Brie Larson's been trying to stay lie low and I think she's just been trying to improve her brand. She has her own YouTube channel now. It's like a very wellness oriented, and like having those difficult conversations, things like that kind. But I, I think whatever star power potential she had between her Oscar and coming into marvel it's i don't think she's ever going to get that back well i mean like to the best of my knowledge since she was in captain marvel she's not been in any like a-list movie mm -mm. i think she, she's had like a couple of you know cameos in other marvel films like literally seconds mm -hmm. uh, i think maybe she's done one like low budget thing that she produced and that was it like because i i I had to make like a video about it just a, a few weeks ago and i was like all right i'll look up and see what she's been up to recently and it's like nothing in the past yeah. like, three years like yeah. how does that happen yeah There's no been, it's very similar to jennifer lawrence because both of them have been had have had to just lie low they don't have that many projects yeah i mean it, with jennifer lawrence at least she had the back catalog of stuff that she's done but yeah i don't know quite what's happened to her like 
Yeah, she's she's a bit. Do I think it's like the studios well. being like, "Oh, we'll call you. We're gonna call you. We are gonna call you any week now." And the agent is like, "Yeah, they're definitely doing it. Definitely. Just hang in there. <laughs> don't book anything else. You're gonna need the time. Trust me." I don't know. I I think there's got to be an element of like the agents, the executives, the the producers. They kind of know. Like with someone like her, she's she's not a popular one, and they don't want to cast her in things. Uh, I just maybe a, a case of like let's just leave it a couple of years, let the the let the controversy die down, and then we'll start getting you in movies again because she is going to be in what Fast and Furious ten or something. Whatever. Oh, <laughs> she is. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Well, I saw her in the trailer yeah. anyway. So good for her. She's yeah. going to be in that, but like obviously she's not she's not headlining it. She's just like a person in it. But right, that's that's the first thing I've seen her in in years. Yeah. I, it's like between her and and what they're doing with the Star Wars movies and maybe even the Avengers movies. I've heard rumors they're planning to uh, push those back as well. Maybe they're finally like, oh, maybe we shouldn't just throw shit out. Maybe we should consider this first. <laughs> like, I mean, maybe, maybe it's yeah. the quality of our work. Well, this is it. Like, I, I think when you get uh, into that position which Marvel was definitely in, where they could almost put out anything and it would make a billion dollars. Like, mm -hmm. the, the momentum behind the MCU was white hot in the lead-up yeah. to Endgame. Um, you almost... Um, but, well, you become complacent, I suppose, because you think, well, we can just make anything. And it doesn't matter how obscure it is, it doesn't matter if it's particularly good, people will come and see it. And you expect that to happen. And so they're now at the stage where it's not happening anymore. And they... Well, either it's going to make them produce better stuff, like they'll up their game, uh, or they'll just, like, sink. You know, because they won't be able to rise to the occasion anymore. I don't know which way it's going to go, really. Yeah. So and, I mean, replacing Ironheart, I think, is going to be the biggest, you know... Oh, Iron Man. I think that's going to be the roughest attempt on their, on their place to, like, replace Iron Man. It's just, that's not going to go well. I, I yeah, because I, I can tolerate a lot of things, but you do not mess with my boy Tony. Yeah. I think that's, that's one of the only characters in Marvel that I really care about. And I thought, like, yeah, if you try and sully his legacy by like having another character come in and you know be a better engineer than he was, and like you know making all these veiled insults to him, like oh, he's a bit of a drunkard and he was a womanizer and he wasn't that good at engineering after all. Uh, that's male. they've already yeah. shot on him with Falcon and Winter Soldier. Remember that shit was ridiculous. Like, that's oh yeah, what? Tony doesn't pay any of his Avengers. No, he was a dick. <laughs> it's like yeah. okay, I forgot they sure. said that. Yeah, it's not even true. Like Age of Ultron, there's this explicit line where he says, "I pay for everything." Like the right. no way he's not like room and board it. I'm pretty sure he even says in Civil War, am I running a bed and breakfast for a, a biker gang or something like that? It's like, yeah, he doesn't pay for anything, guys. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. like, I, I feel like with him, like, maybe he wouldn't, like, set up, like, a, a regular wage or anything for you, but if you just went to him, and, like, if you were one of the Avengers, like, hey, Tony, I, made a, I need a million bucks, he'd be like, yeah, sure, whatever, and just sign you, you a check. I'm like, right, fuck off. Like, that that's the kind of guy he was. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, like, I don't think any of them would have been short of cash if they needed it. Um, it's it, yeah, it's such a weird thing to come up. Yeah, uh, well, someone said, like, weren't they, you know, the vigilante Avengers at that point? It's like, no, the question I think from the guy in the Falcon and Soldier was like, you know, doesn't Tony pay the Avengers? And he said it doesn't work like that. So it's not even about the vigilante Avengers, it's about just generally. And again, it's just like, nah, <laughs> I don't believe you. And it's like, yeah, well, we gotta have a plot, so shut up. Remember, they just said that Steve forgot about uh, Sharon Carter. They just said, "Yeah, he just forgot about it." Like, oh, oh yeah, it's like Daenerys. Like she forgot about the Iron Fleet. You know? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I never forgot. <laughs> 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 this is what we're dealing with. This is modern writing. Yep. But they didn't forget about her. So. Yep. Um, yeah, it was it was interesting that Sharon Carter had to be the one that like killed. What was it? Frickle Jesus or something. I, I don't even know the character's name from from Falcon oh. and the Winter Soldier. Uh, like the leader of the, the flag cult. smashers. Yeah, mm. Carly nah, Morgenthau is her real name, right? Not her. I, yeah, yeah, I can't remember. Her yeah, name. in the. I think it was, was Carly in, in I, the I just, in the show. Carly. Yeah, I just yeah. I know that Disney have tried really hard to make that actress happen. Yes, they like have. they, they put her dead. in. 
Falcon the Winter Soldier, they put her in Willow. Willow. Yep, Solo as well, and she's absolutely disastrous in everything that she is in. She can't act to save her life. Didn't they? Oh my god, have they revealed her to be a girl when you expect a guy three times? Because they did it with Enfys oh. Nest, then they did it in the Willow show when she was fighting that girl. I'm pretty sure they, when they both put their masks up, it was like, ah, oh, look, see, these are girls. <laughs> oh, and I'm pretty yeah, sure that's a good point, actually. they pulled up her mask in Falcon the Winter Soldier, like, see, that's not a guy, that's a girl. She's I can't gonna remember, in, though. She's going to be in Peter Pan next as one of the last boys. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Some of you are girls. So? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yeah. That trailer. That, that, that got that, annihilated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Taskmaster is the famous one, though. For the... I was going to say uh, oh, yeah. Cast Blaster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's like when you make a point of using a male stuntman for all the like difficult fighting scenes and then like have him take off his helmet and it's just like this tiny woman's head CGI'd onto a man's body. It's like, what did you expect the reaction was going to be? Like, of course people are going to mock it. Especially Olga Kirilenko, who's like, you know, she, she used to be a model, right? She's like hyper thin. Yeah. Yeah, but did she not do, um, is it Vikings that she was in? I'm sure she she was something like that. Like she was in Vikings, where she was like a, a warrior woman, and she was pretty good in it. But it's like I'm you, you have it. to, um, yeah, you have to like allow her to to like do her thing and like actually act and um, not try and bulk her out into this like ridiculous suit of armor. Um, oh yeah, some of people saying she was in a Bond movie. Um, yeah, was she was Quantum in the... Quantum Centurion. Quantum yeah, Centurion as in... well. Yeah. She was good. Solace, the one Solace. that no one likes. I like it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I, I still to this day cannot tell you what it was about. Yeah. It was about oil, the I of think. Solace, I think it oil. was about oil. I can't remember exactly. It, it's something <laughs> of boring. <laughs> it's like I vaguely remember that it looked pretty and it's like, ah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I just I think I think more than anything, I just really like the trailer. The movie. Yeah, that's fair play. Yeah. Um But yeah, I mean that's like, yeah, I think the next the next couple of months, I think, are going to be interesting in terms of shows getting cancelled because I think we're going to see a lot more of it. Mm. Uh, I think this could be one of those domino effect things where um, all the all the shows that we knew were garbage that uh, are trying to remake old stuff or that are trying to push a message, um, nobody's been watching them, and I think they they know that they're going to start cancelling them. Um, they'll, they'll make up like great excuses like, oh, you know, it's like, um, the audience wasn't quite there or there's fatigue for this particular genre or whatever, but it's like, everyone knows why you're doing it. Like the thing you made was garbage. Um, yeah. and so, yeah. It was reminded me of that it's... song. Did you ever listen to a drinker about quantum of solace, the YouTube thing? They played all the time on FNT and, and wrote real BBC. It's like. I was just—he says the title of the film, but he keeps changing the words. Like one of them is just uh, "Quantum of Solace." I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Like, it's like a really dumb song. I would have you play it, but you know what? I don't even know if it's copyright protected or not. I, so. I just—I love this idea of working on a movie like "Quantum of Solace," and like everyone involved is like, "I don't know why the fuck I'm here. <laughs> I don't know what's going on? I don't know what this movie's meant to be." You know, I saw a breakdown of like. Uh, Casino Royale versus Quantum of Solace, and I was just like blown away by how much is in Quantum. Uh, sorry, Casino Royale that I didn't realize was there. Like oh, it's that so, is a it's so brilliant tiny. movie in terms of uh, oh, yeah. the Bond reboot that simultaneously has so much to say about the cat. It, like it's the it's best so in the Craig. Right? He just never got that height ever again. <laughs> like, never, no, no. never. It was that, just that it was movie. So bad. That movie lulled me into a, a false sense of optimism for the yeah. oh, yeah. for his tenure, where I was like, oh my god, this is. Compared to like um like Die Another Day, this is so grounded, oh, yeah. so like interesting, so compelling. It feels it feels like it could almost happen. Uh yeah. this is like Bond for like the current generation for sure. Uh and then yeah, you follow up with Quantum of Solace where it's like, oh, this is just a meandering like clusterfuck of a film. I don't even know what it's meant to be. Uh and it just went downhill from there. And then yeah, yeah. you get comments from Daniel Craig like, Yeah, I'd rather slip my wrists than play Bond again. <laughs> Brilliant, like but, really inspiring stuff, Daniel. Thank you. But then you have like you have Spectre. I think it was Inspector where he gets um 
he Fuck. gets kidnapped and then he gets out of his like whatever whatever's covering his face the sack that's covering his face and then it shows like a picture of vesper and it was like mr bond and it points like go here and it was just yeah. like what the hell is this spectre should be studied it's hilarious spectre's this like trust me all of it makes sense movie and it's like no yeah. it doesn't stop I've it i've been like... behind it all i have been there it since was me, day James. one the architect of your I'm... pain oh god <laughs> Yeah, I'm like also I loved your it. Like in the, in the yeah, in the original, it was just like Blofeld was just a guy, just a yeah. sinister like yeah. you know uh, another villain for Bond to take yeah. down. Now it's like he's his Not fucking the adopted villain. stepbrother garbage. It's like <laughs> oh God, it's like a soap opera. Oh yeah, it was so it was think, so bad. When they announced that cast, you know, Christoph Waltz will be Blofeld. I I even remember being like, hey, okay. That Christoph cool. Waltz was red hot at that point, though, wasn't he? Just yeah. Yeah. glorious bastards. Yeah, and well, just, and yeah. Django, yeah. And, yep. and Django, that's right. Yeah, what a waste. That movie was such a waste. Really there, there's a lot of that, though. Like, an actor just becomes flavor of the month, and they get signed up for everything. And, like, yeah. they never really use them to their full potential. You know, the best example of that is... Sam Worthington in Clash of the Titans, Terminator Salvation, and Avatar. Avatar. What is his potential, though? <laughs> well, it's so weird. The, the he fucking unemployment line. It was yeah. like, why is he in everything? And, uh, good God, is he lucky he was in Avatar 1? Because now he gets to be in all the Avatars. Oh, God. Like, that. that's a leading man who's, who should never be a leading man. Like, he's got as much charisma as fucking me on a Sunday morning. Like, it's just... <laughs> Yeah, he do, he doesn't have it. I I don't know how he like. Well, he he's a bit like um, he's a bit like Sophie Turner or any of the other Game of Thrones actors. Like, you know, they they tried to make him a thing for a couple of years and then realized he wasn't going to become a thing and they just like let him go. But like, obviously, he's in Avatar, so James Cameron had to bring him back. Um. Oh, we got yeah. Despot as well. Hey, man. <laughs> Hello. Well, we <laughs> cannot hear you, so oh, I think what? your your mic might be muted. Oh dear. Oh dear. Oh dear. Is it working now? There yes. You go. There Hello. it is. Hey man. Hey, how's it going? Hello. Good, thanks, man. It's uh, it's good good for you to come in. Yeah, thanks very much for having me on the show. Yeah, no, it's cool. I I don't know if we got a bit of confusion around the the, the start time or whatever, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, these things happen sometimes. How long has the show been going on? Uh, an hour now. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just woke up. I live in oh, South shit. Korea. So. Oh, Wait, damn. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, well, sorry about the late start anyway, but yeah, thanks very much for having me on. No, it's cool, man. Like, when I, like, obviously I knew who you were. I knew your accent and everything. I just assumed you were in Ireland. So, yeah. More yeah, yeah. Me, I guess. Um, I think there was, I went on one chat where the guy had me on at 4 a.m., but I didn't say anything because I didn't want him to feel bad, but it was good. Like, I enjoyed it, you know? <laughs> But it's it's all right. It's seven a.m. here, so I'm grand. Yeah, no, it's always funny. Like when people invite me onto a stream, and like they're based in California, and it's like, well, we're gonna be starting at nine p.m. our time. <laughs> it's like, well, great, yeah, that's like five a.m. for me. Is <laughs> <Shit. Yeah. laughs> um, but yeah, man, I, I yeah, I was gonna say like just before we we move on, like I've I've very much enjoyed your videos about like how to fix Lord, uh, sorry, Rings of Power, and uh, yeah, how you came up with the idea of like having a whole separate production like Argo type stuff yeah like you know to, there's to, no other way to get around it because if you don't give them especially your uh your woman jennifer salky the head of amazon studios because she canceled that that show that conan show conan I think yeah conan showrunners Barbarian. and then went over and made house of dragon so you've got to keep her happy you know and, and keep her distracted while you're making the good the proper show the the correct one yeah, I, I'd love it if they actually did that. Like, we're going to make the wokest show you can ever imagine, like, and it's just for her, basically. It's all fake. Yeah. <laughs> it would be a lot better than Rings of Power Season 1 if they just went whole hog with it. Like, instead of doing that, like, half woke thing, just just go all in. It would at least be more entertaining. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, with Rings of Power, damn, it's provided us with lots of entertainment, and that's for sure, just yeah, laughing at right. it. And, God, that's that was some show. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we were just talking there a little bit about um, Willow and, and Star Trek Discovery. They've both been cancelled over the past couple of days. Uh, we're kind of speculating about what other things might end up getting cancelled. Mm -hmm. 
because there's there's a lot of shows that are shit and I, they can never really admit to them being shit but uh it's it's probably going to happen because they're not making any money my understanding is that velma got a season two didn't it mm -hmm. apparently yeah <laughs> I, I think that was always going to get a season two i think that was in the bag already like yeah it's it's already been written already. Just... go ahead sorry i was gonna say do you think it's already kind of been it's already being made it was just uh you know they split it you know yeah, so that's a good that, yeah. You know. yeah although given the reaction to it i wouldn't have been surprised if they had done the same thing that um warner brothers did with batwoman or batguard and thought right we're we're not or was it superguard batguard they they canned over there they didn't Batgirl, even really, yeah yeah they didn't want to spend the money in the marketing i thought well maybe with uh, hbo they don't want the damage to the brand and the reputation and they're just going to can whatever's in there and maybe release it in 20 years as a joke or something but no they're they seem to be proceeding with season two i mean you've got to admire the sheer like determined retardation on this one like velma is like one of those shows that seems to have united the entire internet behind hating it yeah, you know, I don't think there's anyone who who like stood up and defended Velma and said, "Yeah, this is this is a good show, guys. Give it a chance." <laughs> yeah, like everyone seemed to hate it, and it's it's like, why why would you carry on making this thing that everyone despises? Is it just purely for like hate clicks, hate views? I don't know. Yeah, but I, yeah, mean? poor Mind Mindy Kaling got got so much you know so much crap for it just because. For the leftists, they felt like she's too, she's not woke enough, right? She's too assimilated into American culture, and she, they don't like that. Like she's, you know, I I feel like her her trying to write something. She's writing from the perspective of like she was an you know an outsider growing up in Middle America, and so she forced herself to assimilate, which is what people used to do. Doesn't really happen now anymore. So she's writing from that perspective, and they're like, yeah, she's you know she's brainwashed by the colonizers perspective that's why she doesn't like her own face she doesn't like her own bodies they like hate her for it i i don't know if like there was an element like i don't know if in the early stages of velma they they tried to have it be more like balanced and so it was making fun of like left wingers and right wingers like it was yeah. you know it was point it was poking fun at like the patriarchy and like um you know a, oppression of, of different minorities and stuff but also mm -hmm. it was poking fun at like too much political correctness and um the, the stifling of creativity the stifling of comedy all that stuff but it's like that that aspect of it that one side of it just got gradually bleached out and so all you've got is like these occasional little um gags that just seem to come out of nowhere like there was, yeah. there, was there was like one that i remembered where it was like uh uh, talking about how comedians used to be able to like make good jokes before yeah. um, before Me Too or something like that. Yeah, that that was like all you got. But it, like because it's such a, a skewed show in one particular direction, when like a little random gag like that comes in, it just feels like it came out of nowhere and it doesn't really have any any basis. But yeah, yeah. Like, you could have you could have probably done something decent with it if you'd played both sides equally. Mm -hmm. But like I know they would never be able to do that. Like they wouldn't, they wouldn't get yeah. a sign off on it. Yeah, I mean, people like Tina Fey are getting cancelled because Thirty Rock was written very much from that perspective of like shooting shots at both sides, and she did it really well, even though she's very leftist. But now it's Thirty like, that's Rock not... was good. I yeah, it's it, great. Yeah. yeah, Thirty Rock's a great show, and it was written with that making fun of everybody, including myself, kind of perspective, which is what makes makes for good a good comedy. The, the the only criticism I have for Thirty Rock is like Tracy Morgan is about as funny as a cancer diagnosis. Like I don't know why he keeps getting gigs for things. Yeah. Like he is he is just the death of comedy. But didn't you um, think he was funny in the first couple seasons? The way it, you know, I think what Tina is writing, he, not just by himself. I mean, his whole shtick was just like I'm really like, um, like rich and elitist and disconnected from normal people and yeah. like kind of dumb and you know okay you can you can do something with that but it's just like he his performance his delivery was just really kind of not funny like alec baldwin <laughs> was way funnier oh um, yeah so much funnier just, you know just like how how like sure of himself he always was and like when tina fey says like you know I, I could be a fantastic businesswoman and he's like that's not a real word <laughs> that's not yeah, a real just thing. things like yeah. that it's just like he's he's yeah. so like uh you know just like um 
I just, I guess he just, he's so deadpan and he owned that role. But, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. Then he started shooting people on, on his movies. So, yeah. Yeah, and his <laughs> like, wife lied about being Spanish, so. Yeah. So it was interesting stuff, but. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that was, we, we were just finishing up talking about how, um, you know, these shows had been cancelled, but. There, there is another thing that's been going on, and um, you'll be very excited to know that Dungeons and Dragons is getting made into a movie. Great stuff. Um, there's men in it, and uh, the writers have uh, have been very explicit about the fact that uh, they they've enjoyed emasculating their male leads, and I can I can in fact read you the quote if uh, if you bear with me a second. Um, Right, doing their part to continue one of the most uninspired entertainment in recent years, the directing duo of Jonathan Goldstein and John Daly have admitted that their upcoming Dungeons & Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, emasculates its male leads. They claim it wasn't done for woke reasons, but because they thought the idea was funny and fun and fresh. Now, okay. I don't know how funny you guys think it is or how fresh it is, but like after about 10 years of this, uh, it doesn't seem that fresh to me anymore. I don't, I don't I was know gonna, I'd love their explanation of how it's fresh. That'd be interesting <laughs> to know. Yeah. It's like, here's a crazy idea. We're going to make fun of all the male characters in our movie and just, uh, yeah, just make them into bumbling morons. Um, That's the first thing I thought is like, I'm, I'm assuming we're going to get jokes where the men screw up doing things. Is that, is, is that going to be a great new fresh idea? Uh, yeah. Whoa, can't wait. Except for, I think that guy from Bridgerton, I think he's going to be the only one who's, who's not going to get that. Why is that? Well, he's brown. Oh, okay. I don't yeah. think that's sufficient, <laughs> though. I mean, you've seen that with um, with Black Panther. They could have replaced... And I think he was the only good black male superhero in the MCU. The only really good one. I don't think the first movie was that great, but he was a good superhero. Yeah. He's really cool. And they instead of replacing him with a different actor, they said, no, nah, we're just get rid of him. So I don't think it's sufficient to be dark-skinned anymore. I don't think that's going to protect men from being emasculated in movies. And I think the MC is particularly guilty of that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually struggling to think, is there a, a single classic hero from movies that have had the modern remake and the update for the modern audience treatment? Is there a single male hero that you can identify that hasn't gone through that treatment in the past year? Because Maverick. I was... Ma I was going to say Maverick oh, was yeah. obviously the exception with the, the Top Gun, but other than that, every time one of them comes in, you, you get some sort of deconstruction or belittlement or some sort of emasculation. Yes. I know, that, that part about Black Panther is super interesting, by the way, because if I remember correctly, the first few weeks of when uh, Chadwick died, I remember a lot of sentiment was like, the character stops with him, you do not, like a lot of the public mm. felt that way, and then Marvel came out and they're like, whoa, 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 we're not going to recast it, we, we, we won't, we won't. But by the time the film came out, a lot of people were like, you should recast the character. The character should keep going. Chadwick probably would have wanted to pass it on. So the, I remember that a lot of sentiment had changed dramatically by the time they actually got to the uh, release. I mean, of the he film. literally did want it to be recast. Like that was um, that was one of his stipulations. He's like, you know, it's bigger than me. Like this role, mm -hmm. is, this character is bigger than just the actor playing him. I, I would rather he was recast than you just, uh, you know, slot someone else into that role. Yeah, uh, like a James Bond. Yeah, and it's like, why not? Why not uh, honor his wish and just recast him? You know, they did it with um, with Rhodey, like with Don Cheadle getting replaced, uh, replacing Terrence. Uh... I suppose the comparison would be Hulk, right? Because that's like a pretty significant character. There's a whole movie for him, and then they still recasted yeah. him. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Yeah. Instead, uh, we go. Well, I guess uh, I guess we can't. They can't do it anymore, right? No, it's too late now. Yeah. So, yeah, well, in, in canon, like, he's dead. So, yeah, yeah. Except unless they uh, do it through the multiverse, which oh, nothing oh god, yeah. <laughs> like, there's all, they there's might do that now that I think yeah. about it. Yep, yeah, there's always yeah. that. Yeah, but uh, th this trend um, is one of the most horrible and um, like exhausting ideas of modern cinema. This idea of like the 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 male lead has to be emasculated, he has to be brought down a peg, he has to be um, deconstructed, because mm -hmm. um, like apparently, in the, the the eyes of modern Hollywood, a straight white male is not allowed to be like just a hero. He's not allowed to be good at anything, and he's not mm -hmm. allowed to just uh, do something genuinely inspiring and heroic. Uh, and I the just think. A cat. 
Well, there there is that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd like. I will never stop movie. talking about that movie. Dude, I suppose well, that's like, another example because well, that's. Well, well, uh... But then it's not. It's not voiced by a white man. It's it's. Uh, exactly. It's oh, that's Hispanic. Actor. And he's a cat, oh, and he's yeah. ca a cat, so he can be. I mean, heroic. I mean, yeah. Genuinely, like I could like happily listen to Antonio Banderas just like talk to me all day. Okay. Like he could read off his laundry list, and I would be like happy to listen to it. But yeah, um, yeah. Like <laughs> when when it comes to these these characters. Um, I, I just think, like, imagine being a little kid growing up now, right? If you're, like, uh, a little um, boy who happens to be white and happens to be probably straight, like, really? like what is your heroes? Like, what do you look up to in cinema? Because yeah. as far as I can tell, you're probably going to be told that you're you're flawed, you're broken, you're toxic, you're evil, you're stupid, um, and you need to be corrected by someone better than you. Um, yeah. That doesn't seem like a very inspiring thing to present to people. And that was my problem with the Oscar, you know, best film nominations, because aside from Top Gun, which is great, um, you know, if you look at uh, the movies were good. The Whale, you know, all, all these other movies we talked about earlier, they were good. But the representation of the men was very, you know, it was very emasculated. It was very broken down, very, you know, even a, a movie that I chose not to watch it's called talking women i just looked at the synopsis and it's about how this colony of women find out that the men are doing something weird and what they're doing is that they're drugging them and raping them and now they have to figure out what to do with this information and it's just it's like even like not being a guy i'm so tired of it i'm so tired of seeing men in that position all the time that constantly being told like that they they're so terrible and toxic and destroyed and pathetic and uh, whatever other synonym and you can come up for that yeah um like i would be fine if there was some variation like if there was you know i, I say you want to do that deconstruction of certain characters okay fine like but then you have other characters that are just kicking ass and like still doing um you know the the great things that uh, you would want from your heroic leads. Tom Wick's um, going right. He's still going. People like the fourth one a lot, apparently. I mean, there is that. Extraction. Well, I don't know the character name, but the Extraction guy is getting a sequel. I mean, Extraction yeah, was good. Extraction was good. Good, 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 fun movie, but um, it was mm -hmm. it was not a big cultural touchstone. If you know what I mean, like it doesn't right. have a, a great platform. It's just like a fairly um, you know niche action movie. Which is great fun. Don't get or even wrong, the new but, uh... Guy Ritchie film, Operation Fortune. You know, Jason Statham is great in it. There's no deconstruction of of the hero in that. But yeah. it's just not that. It's not going to be that big of a movie. That that's the problem. I think like a lot of the the movies that give you kind of what you might be looking for in your leads, um, they are probably going to be low budget stuff, like relatively low profile. Um, it's good that they're getting made, but it's like they're not going to make a, an impact on the overall sort of culture of, of Hollywood filmmaking. And that's, mm -hmm. I guess, the problem. You know, I, I don't know how you get past that. Um, the only good male represent, like the only male representation last year that I really enjoyed, which I actually thought was the best movie of last year, was RRR. Mm. That was brilliant. That was, that was uh, great, yeah. That, that, I mean, that was like bromance the way it used to be when hollywood was good it was excellent great well, show it, it's funny because like uh i see that movie and like i remember watching it at the time and like there, there's times when it's like you show like a really close friendship between these two guys and i thought if this was made in hollywood they would 100 percent be gay <laughs> for each other like yeah, no doubt about it but it's like, like they're hugging and they're very touchy-feely i don't know if that's an indian thing i, I think yeah i think it's, it's maybe it? a bit of a cultural thing yeah there. Um, it is like we, my parents were actually we were talking about how in india you see a lot more you know camaraderie touching in in the indian culture between men than you see in others yeah um but like, I thought it was entertaining as hell. But are we? What did everyone think of the script here? Well, I, I, I th yeah, this is this is, this is diversion. But like, I, I like the fact that uh, it keep it, it keeps reversing the roles. Basically, it puts like one one side in like the the disadvantage. Um, it uh, it plays on the idea of like, well, what where does a friendship lead you in terms of like when you discover things about the other person that you didn't know. 
um but you you still know that they like were willing to risk their life to to help you you know so like that aspect of it's fine like i always like when it comes to like bollywood cinema like this or tollywood i think it is in this case yeah um i don't judge it by exactly the same standards that we would over here because like it's done from a different like philosophical standpoint like it's all a little bit heightened it's all a little bit melodramatic it's all a little bit over the top uh and so i i wouldn't quite like yeah, I, I wouldn't quite be as critical as I would be of something that was made in the West because it's trying to do a different thing, basically. Yeah, Very I would say my well. biggest criticism of that film would be the, presenta the presentation of the British in India. Because <laughs> I think the yeah. British Empire gets a very bad rap. Very bad rap. <laughs> Hilarious. Man. Man. They, they, they are full on evil Darth Vader. They, they are, Dude, like, Ray uh, Stevenson, what did he think he was doing in that film? I don't know. Like, you are playing was a it, literal cartoon character. Known as was it, was it Alison Duty that was the, the, the woman in that? I, I think it was. Uh, like, like she was in Indiana Jones 3, like the, the Last Crusade. I'm, I think that was her. Um, was she the yeah, good the, guy, the, the the one good British? No, person? no, no, no. She no, was no. she was fully she was evil. The evil one. Yeah, very yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. She was, was the one, one like, no, British torture British. him more. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> by the way, I'm fine with the British being portrayed as evil. I find it hilarious a lot of the time because it's so. It, like I guess it's just made to make other countries feel better. <laughs> like, those I mean, non British, they're just soulless beings. He's like, yeah, sure, whatever. Well, it was it was made from an Indian perspective, and so like you're gonna. I guess they're going to see the British as like colonizers. You know, they were like uh, an imperial presence that like yeah. ruled the country with an iron fist. And so, yeah, like again, uh, I I can forgive it to some extent because it's skewed from a certain angle um, from filmmakers who who have a perspective on it, and it's just that's the culture. You know, Your food um, is evil, did rotting and shit. <laughs> <laughs> that's true and someone else said like me a German hearing about how hard it is that you guys get portrayed as evil in films it's like hey hell, hang on it is the meme <laughs> British and Germans we are the evil people in yeah the yeah we it's are always British and German <laughs> not Irish though so you're alright man the Irish well, we never had a chance characters. They get we never had a chance I'm sure if the Irish had a chance we would have gone off and built their own empire and committed our own crimes <laughs> and all the rest <laughs> Unfortunately, well, we didn't get that chance. We didn't. That, get that a is why I, do war crimes. I, I enjoyed. Have. That's why I enjoyed the King's Man because, like, the the villain in that is Scottish, and he just, <laughs> he's evil because, like, he just wants Scottish independence. Aww. That bastard! <laughs> <laughs> They've enslaved my beloved Scotland. <laughs> yeah, we need more Scottish villains. That's that's what I wanna. That's wanna advocate the petition for. going yeah well, absolutely <laughs> um, but yeah i mean with the uh, getting back to the point that i was making earlier about uh dungeons and dragons like that was a great example of like you guys said the quiet part out loud you know mm. hollywood's always been kind of coy about this like no we're we're not uh we're not here to like uh deconstruct men we're not here to like uh like ridicule masculinity we're just uh reimagining it for the current generation uh but these these guys just had the the absolute brainwave of just saying yeah we fucking hate men and we're just gonna um like humiliate them at every opportunity in our movie yeah great <laughs> that wasn't the only quiet part they said out loud my understanding is that in that same interview they also said that to an extent to a large extent, they were using Dungeon and Dungeons and Dragons as a skin to place over their own ideas and their own thing that they want to do. But they're really not that into the IP themselves. It's just a that... vessel for same thing with you've seen with Velma, and I'm sure we're going to see. It. Did, have, if you've heard about this Flintstones thing that's coming up with um, uh, the same director of uh, Cocaine Bear and Elizabeth Banks. She's oh, yeah. doing a, a modern update of the Flintstones. And it's the same thing. You take an IP that people are familiar with and you use it as a skin, as a vassal to mm. put your own, you know, political it's, ideas and messages and your own crap out in there into the world. But it's, it's a, yeah. It's a platform for the message. You know, that's, yeah, that's no, what uh, no, Kiva Goldman said about Star about. Trek. It's just like, yeah, it's, it's not about entertaining people. It's a platform for our message. Every time, 
Every time I think of the word, the message, I think of it in your voice, a critical drinker. And then every time I think of representation, I hear it in nerd erotics going representation. <laughs> representation. <laughs> um, yeah, like I, I wish I could just make my voice like go echoey on command. Like, yeah. The message. <laughs> Uh, I have been told that it's it, that that thing is starting to do the rounds in like some of the studios in Hollywood. Like people are aware of like that that mocking like the message You're thing. Getting in the way, drinker. You're becoming annoying. I know. Yeah. Like it's only a matter of time before like a red like laser sight starts to appear. You got missing. It's like yeah, yeah. It's like I'll just like my my feed will cut out. Like yeah. yeah, the critical drinker has signed out of YouTube forever. Oh leave God. leave Mahler some breadcrumbs in case you ever go missing. Just <laughs> I'll in yeah. case. Detective thing. I'll make a whole TV show about discovering. Yeah, there'll, there'll you. be like a devious series of clues leading to like the revelation about who murdered me or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then, I, and I believe season, in you, Mahler. Season one finale. I find the big piece of evidence cameras on me, and I just go, "No, it wasn't. It wasn't him." No, <laughs> and then it cuts out. Everyone's like, "What?" And I'm like, "Season two, bitches." <laughs> can, can we call the series the Long Con? Like, oh. I think that would be like that'd be perfect for you. Here we go. Just gonna have to go. get a writer, director, few million dollars. We got this. <laughs> it was Drinker's Evil Twin all along. <laughs> no, damn it. I, uh, it just... Oh wait, go ahead. Because I was gonna say I don't mean to tangent. But just uh, I know three different people who've gone to see Fury of the Gods with nobody else in the cinema. Oh Shazam, yeah, that, that's it's a movie, film, isn't man. It? I don't. I'm but, so, but, ooh. I didn't even realize that was out already. <laughs> nobody well, cares. No one cared. Was, um, no one. I thought yeah, that was I'm coming up, but hadn't been um, hadn't been announced yet. I'm forcing mm -hmm. Az to watch it. I think he hates me. I mean, I would after that. To be fair, like if you made me <laughs> it's watch, probably that, not going to be like, as painful no. as like you know. Uh, no, maybe it will. I don't know. I, I think promises. probably, you know what? I think people are going to come away from it with the same feeling they had from Black Adam. I think it'll be mm. like it was bland, it was inoffensive, it was it was marginally okay. That's probably mm. what they're going to get from Shazam. I know Wonder Woman's in it apparently because they've slipped that oh. out. They have, yeah. Um, because it's like, what 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 will get people in? Uh, Gal Gadot, like she's hot. Like it... people like her. You say like, what yeah, will get people in? Do you think it wasn't? Do you think it was like a complete accident or not? Then that this has been found out because I was going to say like there's no marketing material with her in it, right? The, this is this is calculated one hundred percent. It's like mm -hmm. what is going to attract people to this movie? The Gal Gadot still got some marketable value yeah. with Wonder Woman. Let me put it this way, right? If you're if you're a, the higher up guy and I'm a higher up guy and we're sorting out marketing and you're like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna accidentally leak some Wonder Woman imagery, or I will get people in, and then I I would just be like, let's just promote the movie with her yeah but then you're like well she's only in it for five minutes and i'm like yeah whatever <laughs> like whatever let's just use it it's not illegal yeah that, that's that, i don't understand why they wouldn't use her overtly um well I, again like all of this is part of this weird um you know creative dead end which is like the the dc eu hmm. Whereas, like, you've got Wonder Woman, you've got Aquaman, you've got The Flash. They're all part of, like, a dead franchise. Like, they're none of them are getting rehired for James Gunn's new version of DC on film. And so this is, like, the last hurrah of uh, of all these, like, different characters, all these different mm -hmm. actors, you know. But I, I was going to ask, them. how is how is Ezra Miller still, how does he still have The Flash job with the movie no coming idea. out? No, no, yeah. no it's not he, it's, 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 much money it's in the they, movie. them. Oh, sorry. Because it's, it's it's not it's not he Miller. It's How like does they, Ezra? Then... It's yeah, it's not he somewhere. Miller. <laughs> it's not he it's Miller. They Miller. It's they Miller. Uh, so people that, say that is, is literally like they's only like defense against all this like horrible stuff that they has apparently done. Mm. It's uh, it's yeah. It's like well, I'm part of a marginalized Ezra community. Norman, if he was just a normal straight white man married with a kid maybe do you think that he would have been cancelled by now do you think that his his <laughs> you know that his vague tenuous grasp on some sort of intersectional victimhood it's very obscure no one quite knows what it is but he calls himself they them okay so he can have some victimhood points we're not quite sure how many he gets because he's still right. a white man but if he didn't have that do you think he would be out of a job right now they would definitely be Sorry, um, they. fired by, by this point yeah. Um, yeah. But um, the, they is like uh, an absolute, uh, they is box office poison. 
Is it they is or they are? Because I, I wonder, is he a plurality of people or is he still just a singular person? This you know what? I, I can't I can't even be arsed trying to like formulate a <laughs> sentence that incorporates they as a as a pronoun. I was like basically ruined the chances of success of this movie by being uh, a criminal, essentially. Uh, and so Well can Batman save it? That's the question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's got, back. It, I don't mean it's got, quality it's wise, got, I mean you know, people going to see it wise. It's got mm. two Ezra Millers in it, so like what what's, what's you need a lot of money better than one. Yeah, that'll that out. Yeah, that's be more than I want to see. Yeah. Um uh, by the way, because some people were saying she is in the marketing material, Gal Gadot, and I was like, so either one, you're talking about the leak where it was like one promotional thing in one country that got leaked, or she really is in the trailer and I just didn't even see her. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see her in the trailer. Because I, I, I had no idea. And what a great this is what I'm saying. Like if you're gonna have Gal Gadot in the marketing, you put her in the marketing. You don't just like yeah. what a weird front and center. DC is in I such mean, a weird place. Well the thing is like who realistically cares about Shazam? Um Jimmy. Do you Mother? Do you baggage? Do you despot? Like I I, I enjoyed the I'm... first movie. I don't particularly care about it, but I mean, the character is... In, I'm indifferent to the character, but I thought the first movie was a fun movie. It was it was a pretty good comic book movie as far as... And it was it was kind of generic, but it wasn't as generic as, for example, I think you mentioned Black Adam or uh, Morbius, which I actually thought wasn't that bad. You saw Morbius? didn't deserve a Razzie nomination, but... Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I was you see wondering if is, is it a victim of superhero fatigue because last year i thought that that was why morbius got such a bad rep because it was a bit generic and it, it was mm -hmm. a bit crap to be fair but it wasn't as bad i think as its reputation suggested and okay. i do wonder if shazam is maybe another and, and black adam maybe superhero fatigue and i'm thinking maybe is shazam are we at the point now where people really need a reason to go see a, a superhero movie if there's not a really good reason they're just not going to show up for it in large numbers mm. yeah I mean, and there's it's, so it's, many of them you know yeah, and it's a very similar tone all the time, right? Someone, there's a bad guy, someone says very something very threatening, and the main person goes, ooh, and makes a joke. And it's just like, it's always the same beats. And mm -hmm. so you're just kind of, it's like search and replace a little bit. I, I think I would argue now, like the stage that superhero movies are at, you probably have to work harder to make mm -hmm. your movie a success because you, you need to do something to stand out a little bit. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we, we talked about, uh, I think Razorfist has a pretty good video on this, like the stages of the destruction of any kind of genre. He, I think yep. he tries to appeal that the Western genre went through a particular set of stages and that the superhero one is doing it. And I think, are we the end of deconstruction or something? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> like we're at, we're at the deconstruction phase moving into parody. The parody is the final phase before a, a genre. You don't need dies. to worry about parody. Yeah. We got that covered with the regular movies. Yeah, but that's not intentional. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. the problem, you know. They didn't want to do that. It's just like it is like laughable in its own sense. But yeah, um, yeah, parody like intentional parody is the final stage of a genre, and then it dies. And so, uh, yeah, give it another year or so, and I think probably that will be it um, in terms of in terms of superhero movies. And to be honest, yeah, I've said this before, like, I would be fine with that because I feel like we've had 20 years of this, essentially, and it's it's been a long time. Poor I'm Kevin Feige, he on. wants 80 more. Oh, Kevin. God bless you. Uh, I can't imagine what, it, like, daily life must be like for Kevin Feige. You know, like, for, for any normal studio executive, it might be like, well, we've got this new movie that we've got planned. Like, for, for Kevin Feige, it'd be like, well, there's like 27 different, like, movie and TV productions that we've got in the pipeline right now. Uh, what's your thoughts on each and every one of them? You'd be like, what the fuck do I even do with this? Like, it's just insane. I actually read some, some crazy statistic the other day. Disney currently have, and I think the number is 32 remakes in production right now god wow. and you just think to yourself jesus like it, it's serious yeah 32 it has 32 this remakes is, in production disney this right is, now this is uh ouroboros isn't it it's it it's literally just the snake eating its own tail mm. like we're think... remaking things and remaking them and repackaging them it's like 
why why well, would just we ever come like, up with new ideas like just just remake something that was popular before that's the mindset now this I must have been the... based oh, on end game times where <laughs> That's such an ironic thing to say. Endgame times, in Avengers Endgame times, where they were just like, wow, we can just make everything. And they ticked yeah. a whole bunch of boxes, and we're still seeing the suffering deg degradation of that decision. Because I was just thinking about what you just said, and I was like, I wonder if Cruella 2 counts. It probably does, right? Because it's technically, like, I don't know what these well, things count as anymore. Well, whose life was enriched by doing, like, a, a live-action remake of Beauty and the Beast, or mm. Cruella, Me. or, um, <laughs> or, or The <laughs> Little Mermaid? <laughs> Robert Zemeckis' career was reinvigorated with the the Pinocchio remake. Oh yeah, everyone loved that one, didn't they? <laughs> Did you that know voice uh, acting? How could the guy who made Back to the Future have made I that? Know. That made me so sad. That was my saddest viewing experience of 2022 because that's my favorite yeah. trilogy, and mm. it just it's just sad to watch. I couldn't. It was hard. It was genuinely difficult for me to watch that movie. It'd be like it'd be like as a teenager, like you see your English teacher, like uh, like lying in the gutter, like trying to eat a kebab out of the the, the fucking street, you know, like drunk out of his mind. That that that's where it's at. So sad. Um, uh, well, Fringy, I've been there. It's okay. Fringy yeah. told me that apparently in the Razzies, obviously Pinocchio was in the running, and they had to put after it in brackets, not the Del Toro one. Like, <laughs> yeah, because people adore the Del Toro, Del Toro one. It's like, why the fuck is that in the Razzies? It's like, no, 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 not that one, not that one. Yeah, it's the new one. It's just um, when, when you think about like, because what did Disney used to be all about? It was like we're gonna retail um, fairy tales. You know, all these these classic fairy tales from like uh, for the eighteenth, nineteenth centuries. Um, we're gonna do modern retellings of them, uh, and great, you know that that sustained them for decade upon decade. Now their idea is like we're just gonna retell the same stories again. Like why not tell new stuff? New stories. Like there's yeah. still there's centuries worth of stories, mm -hmm. not even just from like uh, Western canon, but like, you can you can travel to the Far East. You can go anywhere with with your inspiration for your your folklore. For your your movies and stuff like there's so much out there mm -hmm. why not like capitalize on that why not tell no. new stories like why not do like things that are new and interesting why mm -hmm. just re redo the same thing over and over again mm -hmm. it used to be a guarantee of money but i guess they're not so sure anymore right right i mean that's the that's been the problem isn't it they've been financially successful like beauty and the beast made like a billion dollars didn't it what was the last really successful live action Disney abomination? Because I know that there have been, there were a couple of major successes in the early days, but I can't remember the last time one was a real smash like Beauty and the Beast. It's been it's been a while. And people I oh. think are getting really sick of them and and some of them have bombed recently. Like I think all the ones last year absolutely bombed. I think you're but, right. Um because obviously Lion King was what, twenty nineteen? And that's considered mm -hmm. the live action Lion King, which is contemptuous but whatever <laughs> like <laughs> the that i i have a special hatred for that movie as does most people but it's that one made over a billion right I think. probably did yeah. yeah and they're making a lion king 2 i'm pretty sure so good luck with that Always one folks. gonna be more yeah yep yeah i wonder after peter pan and uh little mermaid what what like reshuffling they're gonna have to do because there's that mm. initial goodwill right that results in a lot of people going and seeing those movies but now there's massive doubt about disney's ability to produce anything good yeah at this point do you, guys, yeah. do you three know they they made a live action lady in the tramp and it's on disney plus uh no what? i had no idea that exists and i hate that it exists i haven't seen it i saw the trailer and i was just like Ugh. But it got quietly released. You know what I'm Disney doing Plus. tonight. Well, <laughs> Disney, Disney have done loads of these, like, um, what would you even call them? Like, there used to be direct to video sequels to things. Like, you've got, like, Lion King 2 and stuff. And, like, no one ever saw it, but it was just, like, a direct to video um, sequel to the, the, the box office yeah. movie. Um, and it was just, it was things that Disney put out just to fill in the time. Like, and, um, you know, it would, it would get put into the Disney vault and released like 10 years later or whatever. Um, but now it's like, that's their mainstream movies. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's what they actually rely on to make them the money. And it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of a, a scary concept, I suppose. Everything we see coming out feels like it's just biding time until their actual shit comes out because nobody knows if they actually make anything anymore. 
But then the like actual a, shit never comes. Like that's what I'm saying. Thing. Like Book of Boba Fett and Kenobi, they would have just tied us over until and then it's like until Mandalorian, which was always designed to tide us over until and it's like uh, uh <laughs> like, Oh my god, it's like anything. an endless yeah, it's like an endless thing. It's like there's there's something good coming theoretically at some point in the future. Just bide your time. Mm hmm Yeah, we'll all there. there all their, you know, non recreations of animation movies in 2022, Lightyear and Strange World were just absolute duds. Did any of you see Strange World? I did. How bad was it? So bad. So, so bad. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I only watched okay. it because I wanted to make a video about it. So, um, and sometimes I do feel like, oh, am I bringing a very pessimistic lens? Because it's like I'm intentional, you know, I'm intending to make a video about it. But, Honestly, I tried to give it a fair shake and it was just, it was not good. It was written very much with, as the drinker would say, the message. Yeah, that was my understanding of it. And yeah. I also thought it looked kind of hideous, the animation style that's become very generic. And it's to a point now where you, if you take, for example, Lightyear and you take Strange World and you just copy and paste bits of those movies together and you show it to someone who doesn't know anything about those movies, they might think of it, it's just the same thing. That's how generic yeah. the animation style is and how plain and ugly you compare that yeah. to something like uh Guillermo, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio which I thought had a beautiful animation style mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and really put Disney to shame because they're they're coming out with their own remake of Pinocchio which looks absolutely hideous right. Dude, so the talent, the talent is there they're just not at Disney they're they're working at other places so mm -hmm. it's not a question it's not a case of there aren't directors and there's not talent doing this or animators i really feel sorry for the disney animators because these are people who are, they're out they are artists they grew up dreaming about being animators and making cartoons in a time when those things were really good back in the day and now they're sat in rooms making this disney garbage it must be really soul destroying for the artists that are forced to do this to make a living yeah imagine if disney get a hold of ai animation as well <laughs> oh then, you know God. all of them are gone them yeah and you know with strange world so much of the thesis was like out with the old in with the new perspective so there's this like if if you look at how people typically learn lessons in a story it's this it's this like transfer of knowledge between generations right the, the older generations have all this experience the younger generation have a few fresh perspective but this was a very much like the oldest generation is is needs to be basically educated by the youngest gen generation we need to be looking to the youngest so that was like the overall thesis so everything kind of lends to that in particular yeah that's uh that's another running theme of what i suppose what you would call the message whereby the younger characters are more enlightened it doesn't make any sense like how can the younger be more enlightened than the old but the idea yes. is that the old belong to an archaic time they have uh ossified beliefs that must be updated and mm -hmm. the young have been raised in this new exciting time and so they have a fresh perspective on the world and we should embrace you know i don't know give, give votes to 12 year olds and things like that yeah it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's more like uh yeah forget the past kill it if you have to mm -hmm. exactly that well, just, I mean, not, that's not it and it's just like th this yeah this ridiculous idea of like the the wisdom of youth it's like no have you seen young TikTok? <laughs> I'm not, I, yeah it's like i'm not so old that i don't remember being young and it's like i know even looking back i was dumb as fuck back then i'm still kind of dumb but like even then it's like you, you are full of like idealism and um unformed beliefs mm -hmm. that are not tempered by wisdom and experience you know yeah. you you need to learn from that like that that uh experience is what molds you into a more rounded person but it's like they don't want people to go through that they just mm -hmm. want them to um have that like unfiltered un un uh, untempered belief in themselves mm -hmm. that that is not what makes uh that is not what makes a person great and it's not what uh, leads to great things um, are you sure that what you don't really need yeah, is a 15 16 year old brat teenage girl telling you what you should and shouldn't think and telling you that you you know what have you done for me lately you might have saved the world for me last year but you're a loser for sure, now. yeah yeah like, yeah no for sure really like if i'm if i'm to, to correct your life for you and set you on course if if i'm 
dubious about like where I'm heading in life and stuff. Like uh, as a man who's almost forty years old, like I definitely would go to a sixteen year old girl and say, like, well, what should I be? Like, where should I be heading in life? What what wisdom can you impart to me? Because yeah. clearly you have uh, you have more experience of life than I do. <laughs> you know? At the end of the film, he's like, oh, my daughter helped me figure out that I should help people. Yay! Like it was very clear she helped. Okay, she was very smart. And she was remember so that part smart. of the film where he's like, oh my god, we're stuck in the microverse and we don't know what will happen to our family. We don't even know the political situation. This is what's going on. We don't even know if we're safe. And then she's like, wow. All these excuses to avoid helping people, dad. Yeah, dad, you should just help people. Like, you know, imagine if they'd like been teleported into like 1930s Germany. And they're like, <laughs> oh, this... This 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 party that's just trying to like uh, bring like socialism to the masses and uh, and you know like elevate the status of their country. We should help them, Dad. Like, what's your problem? You know, it's like, yeah, but, okay, cool. Like, nothing bad can possibly come. Of this. Cassie Lang founds the Gestapo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. They should have just sent her. This back is the, in the, time. the dumb shit that they don't ever ever consider in in these movies. It's just yeah, just blindly help people. Don't even stop to think about what what uh, this could mean long term yeah, yeah they should just send her back in time and tell hitler not to be a dick like she should go to hitler in like yeah. a beer hall in 1927 and say hitler don't yeah. be a dick yeah it's never too late to stop being a dick yeah and and with that shakespearean level inspiring monologue, <laughs> hitler will suddenly see the light and the world will you know not have had to go through the worst nightmare of the 20th century yeah yeah, just if, oh, if only she had spoken up and yeah people if only she was there but unfortunately there were no 16 year old girls in 1920s germany that's yeah, but, a modern invention yeah remember yeah remember when movies like used to teach us like hey um wisdom and experience has something to impart to the next generation yeah you, know, you don't have to like follow everything they say uh, you <clears> know <throat> word for word or anything but like you know you can take you can take some lessons from them some experience from them mm. uh, and carry that forward into your life you know, that's that's the whole idea of like generational wisdom. Now the original it's just Lion King. Yeah. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. But now it's uh it's like, well, you know, the the young generation, they've got idealism on, on their side. So that's mm -hmm. that's definitely the thing you should follow above anything else. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. It's I, yeah, it is. I mean, the original Lion King told that story so perfectly, right? Is that when he's obviously just a little kid and you don't expect him to know better when his entire you know, his entire universe is destroyed and he's cast out and in without that proper guidance from his father, he actually turns into this very hedonistic, you know, living for the moment type of person. And then who encourages him to get on track and figure his life out is Nala, is the, is the you know, female influence of saying, hey, you need to grow the hell up and look at the world beyond your own daily needs and see that people need you. People need you to step up and own up to your responsibility. And he, and he does that. And, and that's exactly, I mean, I know, Drinker, you talked about this in, in Peter Pan, right? And I was going to um, bring this up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting idea of, um, you know, I think um, the paradigm in previous generations was that, like, quite often women would be a, a, a maturing influence on men. Yeah. You know, they were they were the ones that would say, like, well, you, you need to let go of, like, you know, some of your childish, um, you know, fantasies of, of uh, you know, adventure and stuff. And, like, it, it's about, like the day-to-day -day life of, of just getting by and um, you know that was quite often a, a thing that uh, female characters would excel at you know because that mm -hmm. was that was what they had to be grounded in um, and that was the, the the philosophical basis of Wendy versus the Lost Boys you know she was a person who initially um, was reluctant to mature into adulthood um, was was hesitant about the the responsibilities that came with that, but she was ready to take it on, mm -hmm. um, and she ultimately encouraged the other lost boys to embrace that as well because that's part of um, that's part of the reality of life. You grow up, you know, you move right. to a different stage in life. You can't just be a kid forever. Right. Uh, you can't you can't just do stupid childish things forever, and you have to move beyond that. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe that that role 
the idea sits more naturally with uh, with female characters because they they mature quicker than boys anyway in life you know yeah the, the, that's part of uh, that's part of growing up we have um, but we have that built into our biology right at some point it's very clear you know every every woman knows that moment where they suddenly actually mourn for the fact that they're not girls anymore we have a very clear indication from our bodies that we are now women and it's also like a lot of our temperament changes at that point so like if you look at just the pers personality structure of a woman versus a, a girl versus a boy we have the same amount of positive and negative emotion before puberty and after puberty women have a lot of negative emotion it just really spikes and suddenly so like you're as a girl you're like depressed all the time suddenly and you're like what the hell is happening so you're you're forced to sort of deal with your own own you know reality of growing up and that's why women do mature sooner and then encourage men to keep up right and and a lot of that dating dating process is women harshly judging men and saying you're not good enough you're not good enough it's a very harsh light that women put on men saying you need to step up and it's interesting because san francisco where i live is a lot of people call it neverland because it's a good place to come and not have to grow up because there's always some opportunity to stay a lost boy if you're a man you don't really need to to uh date your way into that that serious setting right you can just be you can make a lot of money here not anymore but you used to be able to yeah. make a lot of money here and just and just live a very hedonistic life and not not have to grow up well i think um yeah i mean even i'm not so old that I, I don't remember like uh like being in school and stuff and like yeah you you got to a certain age and like the girls they they just kind of changed and like obviously they you know they mature they hit puberty and stuff perhaps a bit earlier than the the boys do and their whole attitude changes and it's like you you got that sense back then like they have they've changed to a different level they've they've uh you know they've become slightly different people um, mm -hmm. and that that comes to you as well but it takes a couple of years more uh before you really understand what that means but like yeah right. that, that um that that idea is kind of what the whole peter pan um universe plays upon like that that boyish desire for adventure and stuff and like not wanting to grow up but like ultimately it does come to every person and like you're you're ultimately not going to live a, a fulfilled life if you deny the reality of your own life if you deny the fact that you're growing older and you have to move to different stages you know you can't you can't be like 40 years old and still acting like you're 20 and still like going out and partying and, and just like being a kid essentially right. um yeah. and so yeah. like perhaps that comes more to to women earlier but then like they they draw guys into that and like they they learn it too you know um, yeah but i think that's what i find weird about you know even something like um du dungeons and dragons i always say the opposite dungeons and dragons that that like this over masculinization of women and i think with, or even with peter pan like the way women are being written it's this desire not to be the responsible ones anymore we don't it's as if like we are being written that we want to be just as frivolous with our responsibilities as young boys or young girls can be. We too want to be young forever and like forever bachelors and not not have to have that nagging sense of like, is this really the right thing to do? And that's that's where all that movie making is headed is like women can be women can be just as irresponsible for their whole whole lives. Well, I, I heard of the, the, these interesting videos that have like there was one that came out recently where it was a woman who was like, I don't know, 36, 37, not old, but by any means, but like, you know, um, no longer like a child either. And uh, basically saying that uh, she'd been in a relationship, she would got divorced and she'd done the math and she realized like her chances of like meeting a new guy and settling down and like being able to start a family before she was, I, I guess, like, before like she got into an age when it was going to become really difficult were pretty mm -hmm. slim mm -hmm. and that was her facing up to that reality of oh my god like i've uh, i've wasted the time that i had available to me uh and that time is running out very rapidly 
that's um, quite a sobering thing. But it, it, I guess it's the reality of being one, a human, but like two, uh, especially a woman where like maybe you don't have as much time as you might think. Yeah. You know, and you, you kind of have to, you kind of have to settle into the, the plan that you have for your life. Yeah. Um, and if you don't do it, then you're eventually, you could wake up to that point where, oh my God, I'm 40 years old and I haven't found anyone and I'm not going to be able to have children now. Uh, I've, I've missed my shot. That can happen. Yeah. Uh, but people are being sold a lie that they can just wait forever like they, they can just party and do whatever they want and not uh, not have to like think about any of that stuff it does catch up on you unfortunately time is it waits for no person you know you saying men and women need a reboot i'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> biology doesn't care about your ideology hmm. but that's that's the reality of life unfortunately like we're we're ultimately just highly evolved monkeys that uh like have lucked out and that we're able to make stuff uh but it doesn't change what we are uh and you know you you get to like 40 45 you ain't gonna be having a family anytime soon you know that's unfortunate but there it is did you reference that documentary uh unplanned childlessness it's doing no, the rounds so. on uh it's a very good documentary it's uh I think it's an Irish fella, actually. He's got a bit of a weird accent. I think he's lived in America for a long time. And he did a documentary about all these people that, especially women who don't have kids, but they never planned not to have kids. They did want kids. It just never happened for them because they didn't meet the right guy or they kept delaying it and delaying it. And then the next thing they know, they're, they're still young. They're like 35, 36, but they couldn't get pregnant. And this is apparently very common. And well, I think once you get past 35, it becomes harder and harder. And again, like 35 is not old, but like biologically speaking. It's very speaking, harrowing though. Like the, but the a, research on that is, is very inaccurate. They've, it, they've leveraged data that's really old. So it's not quite right. It's actually after 40 that's really difficult. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, the, the, it's the long-term things that people don't think about. People, when, we, when we're planning life, you often think about what am, what am I going to do in my 20s and 30s? And then beyond that, people don't really think that much. And there's a part in the documentary where he goes to Japan. And he visits this very desolate looking apartment block. Honestly, it looks like something from The Last of Us. And it's completely full up. Like there's people living there, but they're all in their 70s and 80s. And a lot of them are very old women who never had kids. And it's really sad because these people are completely isolated. No one ever visits them. And he goes and interviews a woman who's in her 80s. And the woman is talking about how she's contemplating suicide because she feels so alone in the world. And she has, she feels like there's no purpose. She's got no family left. It's like, if you don't, the fact is, if you don't have a family, that could be your future. It's at, at, when you get to an age where let's be honest about this, society doesn't care about you anymore because uh, the reality is that society doesn't care that much about older people. Um, and then there's other really bad stuff like uh, old people who don't have families being taken to, to old folks' homes and then they get physically abused there. And then when they die, they get, uh, there's no one for the funeral, so the, the cremation place just, just cremates them and, and what talks about what they do with... Sorry to be a, a bit of a diner-like, but that is the reality. <laughs> this like, morale oh. minus one. You're going to bring out a clown. <laughs> <laughs> just do, 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 do. Yeah. Well, no, but like, this is... Uh, Everybody well, take I a guess, shot. Yeah. Uh, hey, I'll do that. But yeah, there used to be this, uh, I guess, this recognition of like, you, you know, you get to certain stages in your life and it's time to do certain things. Like, you know, your 20s yeah. are for partying and having fun. Your 30s are where you get married, you settle down, you have children. Uh, 40s is like where you, you mature, uh, you bring your, you raise your family and all that. And like you, you rise to prosperity. Like that, that used to be like a pretty logical progression of your life. And now it's this idea of, yeah, like I, I said earlier, that you can just be a, you can be basically a, a, a grown child as long as you want. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you decide it's time you can start a family, no, you can't. You know, like l biology uh, ultimately steps in and says, no, like you're too old for this stuff. You know, you, you yeah. can't be doing this anymore. And yeah. that's, that's the unfortunate reality of life, but like there it is. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of people are struggling with that. I think, uh, you know, I think we had talked about this like ages ago, uh, but Sex in the City really sold that dream that you can, you know, just kind of focus on your career and you don't really need children and a lot of, so I think over the next 
10 to 20 years, we'll probably see a lot of instances of people analyzing like women who chose to remain child childless because of Samantha as this great, you know, great bachelor. And, and then what, what do you, how do you feel when you're now 45 or 55 without well, children? Didn't the, didn't the author of those books come out and say like, I'm, I'm, in my 60s now and i'm really unhappy like i'm divorced i don't have children and like i'm tremendously like lost in life i don't know where i'm supposed yeah. to be now because i don't have anything to anchor me and i thought yeah. what a horrible what a horrible thing to end up with you know yeah. th there's eventually going to come a point where like all these like glamorous parties and stuff that you go to like the, they're not as appealing anymore Mm -hmm. uh, maybe because like you've done them so many times or because you're older and like the people that are there are like 20 years younger than you whatever it might be um, and maybe you you feel like it's time that you move on to that different stage in life but you can't because that door is closed on you now that's yeah. that's a horrible position to be in but like it's this lie that's been sold to people yeah for for years now yeah, and you know, the lie started with partially started with, oh, you know, your career is really important. And I actually don't think that that's a lie. I think a lot of people, a lot of conservative people really criticize that idea that telling women your career is important is not a good thing, that it's they should actually look at the, their family as, as a more important thing. But I think it's stages of life. There, there's a stage where your career should be very important to you. And I think I have seen a lot of women, especially in the Indian culture, who have not had an opportunity to have a career because Indian culture traditionally has been oriented towards saying once, you know, once a woman is through college, okay, it's time for you to get married. It's not like that anymore, but I've seen just the long tail effects of women who were raised under that situation and they didn't have an opportunity to go out in the world and prove their worth in some other contexts outside of just raising children and having a husband. And it along the long term impact of that is that you don't feel good because at some point your kids grow up and you have no idea what to do with your life because someone told you you're going to just be taking care of your family your whole life. But that's not what happens anymore. And I think it is important to prioritize your career. But then for most people, at some point, it is very fulfilling to have children because you're you're going to have you're going to have a meaningless life after a certain while. Your career is not going to be that crucial to you when you're older. I think um, it's a balancing act, I suppose. Like maybe for men, it's a little bit easier because like there's less pressure on you to be the 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 parent, like to that extent. And so like maybe the man can like say like I'm going to focus on my career, but like I'm also going to have a family. Um, Maybe for the woman, she has to make that choice at a certain point. You know, yeah. like, well, what is the the important thing? Is it I'm going to be a mother or I'm going to be like a, a career oriented person? Mm -hmm. um, but like, yeah, I, I I think with any person, like you you shouldn't define your whole identity just on being a parent, just on raising children. Like there needs to be things beyond that because eventually those kids are going to grow up and move out. And uh, what are you then if you don't have if you don't have that? to be your identity so yeah. there needs to be like a balance there um but yeah like that balance isn't always easy to strike i suppose yeah um but yeah i can get like that i i, I guess like life for most people is not always a, a a straight up like choice between one thing or another it's like well there, there's things that are important to me like i want to be a parent i want to raise the next generation Mm -hmm. um, but I also want to have things for myself beyond just like being a mother or being a father or whatever. Um, so it it's a I guess it's a tricky balancing act, but th that's that's part of growing up. That's part of like what life is. I suppose you have to like find a way to balance those things. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um. Anyway, we're getting very philosophical there, but we yeah. do have. Uh, a whole bunch of super chats that have come in while we've been talking here. So if you guys are okay, I can try and answer a few of these as we go. Let's do Let's it. Do it. All right. They're going to be for everyone. So I'll do my best to like put them out there. So uh, JK Vozo is three parter. So it's, uh, uh, hey, Miss Claim, I've got a question for you. What is your opinion on girl power seen from Endgame? So this is for you, Baggers Claim. 
Uh, I found it to be very on the nose. I didn't like it. I felt like it didn't really suit because I think the person, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, the person who is first holding the glove is, um, is Marvel, is Captain Marvel. And then all the women kind of around her start to pop up saying like, she's not alone. And I just don't think that that's consistent with her character. Her character is so like Lone Ranger style. She, she, you know, she really does think she's better than everybody. We all know that. And so I just felt like if you want to create a powerful female scene, it should feel like you, it shouldn't feel like you're being, being hammered over the head with it. It should feel natural. It should feel natural to the characters to bind, bind together and need each other for whatever context, like certain scenes that are so powerful where the characters need each other. Like, I think this was in, I don't think it was Infinity War. I think it was Endgame where uh, Wanda is really struggling. She's trying to hold off. They're trying to cat, uh, you know, they're going to trying to take the gem from vision and yeah. she's really struggling. And then the, those three people could show up that are all non-magical people, but you feel so much relief. You see Captain, you see, uh, you see Black Widow, you see, um, what's his name? I forget, Falcon, there you go. And you just feel so much relief because they know how to work together as a team, whereas Wanda's not really set up properly to do that. Like that to me evokes so much emotion where it doesn't feel on the nose for any reason. It just feels natural. That's how I wish they had done that women scene more naturally. Well, uh, I think a really good comparison, right, would be it is Infinity War that has the superior all women scene. It happens um, in their battle in Wakanda where uh, Wanda's getting beaten up and one of Thanos is like, I guess, subordinates. I forget the name of her. She says, like, mm. you're going to die alone. And then I think Black Widow says she's not alone. And Mich fuck, I'm so used to calling her Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> Okoye, 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 yeah. Okoye is there as well, and and mm -hmm. they all fight together. There's no like, whoa, you're all women. Yeah, <laughs> it's just natural. It's really... It just feels natural. Well, or when yeah, Wanda when comes we... in, yeah, Wanda comes in, and they're like, why was she up there? You know. Well, dude, Mantis, what is she doing with all of them in that middle? Like that, fight? it's like Mantis can't she do shit. <laughs> like, yeah, and just. I think having three of them at the same time is one thing. Having literally, what was that, like 25 yeah. all at the same point in the battle feels like, what is going on? <laughs> like, Every woman bizarre. possible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was uh, allow, me to, allow me to elaborate on this question because it was a three parter. So, uh, most ladies I've talked to really liked it, because, which kind of surprised me because of how on the nose and tacked on it felt. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's just one of those cases where I wasn't the target. Thanks for open bar host and distinguished guest. Cheers. Um, um, about that, the easy fix, this has been talked about on a couple of streams before. This is the absolute way to make the scene great for everybody is for the pan to finish uh, with all of the hero girls. And then the last one is Drax. And he says, let's do this. <laughs> yeah. like that, that would make it so that we can laugh with it. And as a female empowerment scene, you'd be like, oh, at least they're having some fun. They're poking at themselves yeah. a little bit, you know? Yeah. That 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 would be a good like joke at the the female empowerment scene, but they would never do that because they would never want to undercut something like that with humor. It's got yeah. to be dead serious. You'd get bonus points if you fill the screen with all these women across this wide shot, and then he just fills the whole screen as it pans over. It's just yeah. him. Like... I mean, he would. <laughs> He's a big guy. Yeah, but uh, oh well. Waylon Becefa says, "Who wins in a fight?" Uh, <laughs> Shook Madik versus Gabe Itchies. Uh, anyway, anyway. Uh, also says, Howdy all. Uh, Oliver Clit versus Hugh. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> G Rection. Uh, Unforgiven or Tombstone. Red Dead 1 or 2. The Ghost and the Darkness or The Patriot. Good day. So, Damn. yeah. So, if we had to choose between Unforgiven or Tombstone, I would choose Unforgiven. 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 Yeah. Red Dead 1 or 2? I would choose 2. I haven't played them, but from what I understand, 2 is the better one, but I don't know. Uh, Ghost in the Darkness or The Patriot? I haven't seen Ghost in the Darkness, so I can't say. <clears throat> the Patriot. Too much fun. Not historically accurate, but very fun. Mm. I mean, when, when are you going to see like a, an American stab into death a British <laughs> evil guy with the, literally the stars and stripes? Because he's brilliant. that goddamn patriotic. <laughs> 
uh yeah the ghost in the darkness is quite good actually but um yeah i'd probably choose the patriot over that um js pena says do a happy hour or for pirates of the caribbean one two and three on june the first the anniversary of when johnny depp won the trial also watch legend of the guardians with by zack snyder oh. will we ever do a pirates of the caribbean i imagine that is up to you drinker but i'm not against I it would, hey audio commentary do. we could do eh I keep talking to you about doing it, but you'd keep saying no. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean? When have I ever it? said no to Pirates of the Caribbean? I'm like, Mola, <laughs> come on. on Let's you. do Pirates of the Caribbean. You're like, no, I, I wanna did. I wanna keep those those plebs waiting. I did that <laughs> Star Trek movie for you, that other star movie with the tracking and the con. So. Hey, you you like that con wrath stuff. No, I'm say I'm saying I'm on board to the point of doing Star Trek, right? I'd be on board with pirates. Pirates are cool. They go yo ho ho and they steal DVDs. They are, yeah. Uh, I, I still love um, oh, Chris. What are they called? Never mind. Uh, but they, okay. <laughs> it's a pirate metal band that I watch sometimes. <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, it's, uh, I'm too drunk for this. Um, Kung Fu Hot Dog says, "Drinker and Mauler, how much physical media do you both own, and is it more video games than films?" Also, gents. Uh, do you get those days when you're filming and end up doing multiple takes in one video? <laughs> I deliberately do at least like three to five for every line anyway. Um, Christ, you're more thorough <laughs> than I am then. And then do we record it three or four times? It's my, my sessions go for hours on end. I just try to get all the lines and I want multiple versions so I can choose in the edit. My, my process Ew. is not normal. <laughs> Sorry, I, I just wanted to jump in with this one. It's Ailstorm. I can't believe I fucking forgot Ailstorm's name. You fool. I, that's what happens when you're a bottle of Jack Daniels in. But uh, <laughs> yeah, Pirate Metal is where it's at. Anyway, like that was uh, that was by the by. Um, but yeah. damn, Molly, you are very thorough. I used to yeah, record release, it at like, least twice, but I can't do it anymore. You get like so. one video a year from me. I'm going to try to <laughs> find a way around getting more out, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, the only time I would re-record is if, like, I genuinely flubbed a line. Like, I just, bleh, whatever I tried to say. Just well, with your persona, right. you could flub a line and people would be like, nah. Oh, good. he's just drunk. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It's like, yeah. He got, he got the character names wrong. He got the film wrong. Doesn't matter. It's, uh, he's just drunk, you know. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Uh, RRTNZ says, uh, Hail Drinker, our friend Dark Arrow has done a detailed comparison between the boss fights of Shang-Chi and Nobody. Entertaining and informative. Cheers. Also, mm. dodge, duck, dip, dive, drink, and dodge. Cheers. True. Uh, yeah. I just realized, yeah, they both have a fight scene on a bus. So maybe that's the yes. comparison. I know which one I'd rather watch, though. <laughs> Dude, I rewatched that one several times on Nobody. It was great. I just, I, I love the fact that he, can, he gets fucking thrown out through the window and then he just gets back into the bus. So it's like, yeah, I'm It's just how I'm slowly he does it. He's just like, all right, <laughs> back in I go. <laughs> oh, what do you make of the theory that, uh, that nobody is a movie about a man who is emasculated and creates this fantasy in his head where he's John Wick as a means of psychologically coping with his emasculation in front of his family? You could definitely make that argument. Like, I think the, the movie portrays it like he's definitely doing this stuff. Like, this is actually happening. But, uh, I just love the basis of the character. Sense. A lot of it doesn't make sense. And I think it, delib it deliberately doesn't make sense. Because when you do look at it and analyze it a bit, it's... It, I, I honestly think the director... And it's not... I know it's a film theory and they're fun. And they're fun to throw around. But when you really look at it, I'll give you one example. There's a scene where he's uh, eating... Uh, in front of the stage in the in the Russian club, and he's got the center table. Now, it, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Why would they just let this guy who isn't Russian, doesn't speak any Russian, walk in and take the center table for himself? That would be reserved or somebody would already be sitting there. And that's just one example of many. Um, and it's because it's a fantasy. If you're James Bond or John Wick in your head, you're going to place yourself in the center table. And there's other things as well, like he, boosts, he bursts into the room full of cash, and start shooting everybody and then burns the cash and then it's like well how did he get there mm -hmm. um, a lot of it doesn't make sense logistically and i think that's deliberate because i think it's a fantasy in his head what do you have to say to that more um i think you're right on the fact that it gets more and more absurd as it goes on but i really like the idea that he is like an ex-hitman assassin person who has to live a normal life and the random frustrations of life are things he can't respond to in a way that he was much more used to in his past life 
And then I love the buildup. Uh, I haven't seen that movie now for a decent amount of time, but I just I remember really getting into the idea that once I knew that that backstory, uh, so many more scenes clicked into place for me in terms of just this is a guy who knows exactly how to solve problems, but everyone expects he can't do it. Everyone expects him to be a loser and unable, mm -hmm. and then he just fucking snaps and loses it. And I was just like, I, even I just even love, um, I love the bit when he buys the 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 business from that dude who's just been giving him shit throughout the entire movie. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm making a sequel to that, right? I think they are. Yeah, as far as I know, yeah. yeah that that and um, uh, Extraction, the movies that I'm like, mm. I don't know if you need sequels, but I hope yeah. they could. Because everyone, as everyone was pointed out, what I mentioned earlier, it's like, didn't he die at the end of Extraction? It's like, shut up. Nah, he's <laughs> good. At, he's good at holding his breath. Okay, Fuck yeah, me. he's he's fine. Um, it's like the yeah, number like, of times extract... James Bond has almost died, except for that yeah, last one. I and think then he's trying to go blow like... up. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think extraction is like an un, an uncouth John Wick. You know, it's mm. the same premise. It's just like an indestructible hero who just like soldiers through everything. Um, the other question that was in that super chat was like, how much physical media do we own? Ah, right. Mm. Something I've been trying to secure now is all of my favorite movies of all time on 4K. That's what I want to do. Um, yeah, it's so funny. I'm just like my dad. He he got everything on VHS back when I was a kid. And he was like, this is it. This is my collection. The DVDs came out. He was like, okay, I'll get Fuck. everything on DVD. <laughs> that is, that is, it. That is he, it. He had to move to Blu-rays. He's refused to move to 4Ks. I was like, all right, fine. <laughs> like, you can stay on Blu-rays. Okay. I think I think when you get to the level of Blu-ray, you're pretty high definition anyway. So you're, yeah. you're probably okay. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that that's... I guess that's the gold standard, isn't it? Just, like, have an entire shelf full of, like, pristine blu-ray movies you know I'll just you what, ready to go there are certain movies i'm buying earlier than others like tropic thunder for example grabbing that on 4k before i'm oh, allowed to yeah, grab it on yeah. 4k ever again god uh grimnack says hail panel what's your thoughts on the mario movie coming out and why are scotty and pippin such a better duo also any update on video game high school watch um well scotty and pippin might be good but they're no tango and cash that's for sure um, with the Mario movie, it looks good. I think it's going to do really, really well. Yeah, it is. It totally is. As someone who's played plenty of Mario games, I was watching. I was like, "Ooh, they don't. They, they've got it. <laughs> yeah. they, it." Doesn't even matter how bad the story is; they'll be fine. Do you yeah. think that that's going to herald a new age whereby video, because traditionally video game movies and TV shows have been thought of as absolute trash? Basically, like B grade and C grade junk mm -hmm. movies yeah. that people watch for fun. Like they're Traditionally, that's what they're like, just just awful. Kind of like mm -hmm. what sci-fi movies were like in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Are we at the point now where they will become the mainstay of cinema? Because, I mean, um, for myself, I, don't I know think if they're going to take the place of superhero Superheroes. movies as yeah. the main yeah. event that yeah. people show up for. I, think it might happen. I don't think they're going to be... I don't think they're going to be the mainstay, but I think they've got lo much more legitimacy than they'd had, like, The thing about it ago. is, comics have been absolutely pilfered it's it's crazy. I know there's plenty for them to take in terms of more stuff, but it's like, why comics? Why did that happen? And it's like, mm. it's not exactly sure. And a lot of people will say, well, it's because of how good the stories are. And it's like, oh, of course, there's going to be great stories in all mediums. And I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, like, man, video games haven't been properly no, utilized at all until yeah. if you look at the, like the last, what, five, ten years we had uh, Arcane, which was runaway hit, like loads of people loved it. The Last of Us had a better viewership than Hot D, apparently. That's, that's, Resident that's what Evil? the statistics I saw. No. TV. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's the thing. There's still really shit what's coming out, but um, they uh, they want to make well, <sighs> what I know. God of War's coming, right? Gears of War's coming. Uh, Fallout's coming. Well, and then even if you, if you, Sonic if and Mario you... already getting theirs, and if they make over a billion, like we may be entering the new era of they'll be like, wait, what are these video game things? And it's like, what's Bioshock? And it's like, oh, Mm. Oh, we could make a pretty good TV show out of that, yeah. Well, e that would be yeah, even if you skip if you skip back like twenty years, we had like the the first Tomb Raider movie. Mm. Yeah, okay, it definitely it didn't do yeah. a billion, but like it was a pretty like successful box office movie in its own right. Yeah. We had the Resident Evil films like that spawned an entire franchise. Like the I don't think any of these were considered going. great though, right? Wait, no, I thought they're, Jennifer they're Lawrence not. was the first ever female. So, Jennifer superhero. Lawrence invented movies, obviously, she did. but like yeah, and women. And women. Yeah, she she invented invented women. I did not exist before. You that. know what? She invented men too. She just got it all. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she did. She invented open bar as well. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, like those were the prototype of like what we have today in terms of like video game adaptations. Like they weren't yeah, you're right. um, massive like like critical hits, but like they they got the basics right to the point where they could sustain themselves as a franchise, particularly Resident Evil. Mm-hmm. Um, but now we're in well, I don't know. Well, um, like this could this could become the golden age of video game adaptations. Yeah, because you see, you know, everyone says like MCU, that was the big old peak of the superhero genre. And it's like, yeah, where did that come from? It's like it was built on X-Men, Blade, uh, Mm. Spider-Man, a whole bunch of others, right? In the same way that the game ones, you'll be able to trace it back to, like you said, uh, Tomb Raider with Lara. That was, I was just checking, budget 115 million and worldwide gross was 274 million. So that's, you know... (laughs) <laughs> it's roughly breaking yeah. even, I think. Meanwhile, yeah, everyone knows Mario's going to make so much fucking money that they'll oh, yeah. announce the sequel straight away, probably. Yeah. 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 And they then probably they'll, already they'll... have the, the ideas in development for a sequel because I think they're that Absolutely, confident yeah. it's going to be a smash. Dude, Super imagine um, is a big success as well. They Nintendo uh, may have them on some level of a leash in terms of what they're allowed to show them and stuff, but as soon as they allow them to have Link and, well, yeah, you uh, know, Zelda Samus. Would be Zelda it, would be huge. Well, Super because... Smash Brothers. Imagine they make a film for that. Hmm. Yeah. It's going to be huge. Yeah, these are yeah. massive IPs. Absolutely massive. Like, if you yeah. were to take the, the Zelda IP, it's worth billions. Yeah. If if it's proven, if the, which I think it will, the Mario Bros. movie is a smash, which I think it will be, mm-hmm. then the IP value of all those Nintendo and, and Sony properties and the Capcom movies and all that, they go way up. That's why it feels like video games might just come in and sneak by and destroy the superhero industry right mm. when it's uh, it could, failing. I don't think it would destroy I, it, I'm but fine it with that. into the second tier. Well, uh, it's that just that it, it'll drag away audiences, right? Especially yeah, if they're like, well, yeah. you, get, you get a Samus movie, a Link movie, um, all these different ones coming out, and then they do the equivalent of the Avengers and Smash Brothers, or even a Mario Kart movie. They can do whatever they want. Could this Mario movie be the equivalent of Iron Man in 2008? Maybe. Mm. Also, from the perspective mm. of a studio, if you do have two hundred million dollars, do you want to make you know the thirtieth Batman movie, or do you want to make the first Mario Kart movie? Exactly. You know these all I mean? seem these are fresh, well, dude. Imagine a yeah, Star Fox movie. Like <clears throat> the problem is, Batman the fairies makes will love money. it. What's that? The problem is that Batman makes money. Hmm. That, that's yeah, the but thing. It's will he make more than Mario? Well, that that you're not going to know until you make one, are you? I guess they're but about then you to, have find, to yeah. You have to invest like a hundred million in order to make it. Well, they're so making a third a... Sonic, aren't they? Oh, well, they I mean, are. they should because like the, the first yep. two <laughs> were, did really well, you know. Um, here's here's another question for you, uh, Shan uh, Wick Reming says. Uh, question for Mauler. The Mauler mm. subreddit on Reddit calls itself the unofficial Mauler fan subreddit. Could he at any time declare it official, or is there a specific reason not to? Um, I have no uh, interaction with it at all. So, I guess I, you know, it's it's in. A, I don't know what the difference between unofficial and official really is when you're a content creator. But yeah, I just if, if anyone was curious, I have no hand in it at all. But I I, I check it out every once in a while. It's a good subreddit, mm-hmm. I think. <laughs> Uh, Zach Winters says, Greetings, Drinker and Mauler. There's current predictions that Puss in Boots will surpass Ant-Man in terms of box office revenue. But this week, <laughs> seeing Disney reap what they sow. Uh, P.S. Mauler, I love the EFAP of Jurassic Park. Hey, glad you did. And um, that's hilarious news, and I hope it's, it ends up being true. I yeah. would love that to be true. Yeah. Little cat movie killed the ant. <laughs> love it. Uh, uh, Waylon Becephus says, Who is your daddy and what does he do? <laughs> Well, uh, my dad's dead, so he doesn't do much of anything. <laughs> He's this... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Sham Wick Wick Rims says, uh, "P.S. My previous super chat for this open bar was tagged as my first ever, which is weird because it was my second. The first being a long time ago. Well, there you go. Maybe like there's a time limit or something, and it it tags it then if you haven't done one for a long time. Not sure." Uh, Luna Slide says, Salutations, gentlemen. I'd like to recommend a 1995 show called Space Above and Beyond. Created by two of the X-Files' best writers, the CGI is Babylon 5 era. Rough, but it's a bit corny at times, but it's genuinely a hidden gem. I've heard of this show. People have recommended it before. Space Above and Beyond. I've not seen it, I'm afraid. Yeah, no, neither have I. Timmy... The blow four says, 
Drinker, Mauler, what are your favorite games from the 2010s? 2010s. Um, I think Bioshock, probably. Resident Evil 4. That's the 20. Jesus, okay, yeah. I'm going to find out. That's the 2000s, I'm afraid. Sorry, I thought it was the 2000s he was talking about. Yeah. Assassin's uh... Creed Brotherhood. <clears throat> That's my contribution. Hmm. Give me a list. I'm terrible with years. Oh, Dark Souls. All right, that'd be one. <laughs> Metal Gear Solid 4, Guns of the Patriots. I think that was the 2010s. I By the think. way, it's Bioshock Infinite that came out in 2013. You're not thinking of that, right, Drinker? I wouldn't have to kill you, right? No, I thought the, the first Bioshock came out in the 2010s. Um, I'm going to assume it didn't. I, I'd have to check the release. Is it was that it old? Oh my god, is it that old that it's like the 2000s? Bioshock 2006 or 8. God, That's what god. I remember it was. Uh, 2007. Damn, oh wow, I, feel... I literally guessed wrong both sides. <laughs> yeah, I feel, I feel really old now. Oh, um, Batman Arkham City was 2011. I remember enjoying the hell out of that. Super Mario Galaxy 2. Um, I didn't play that. Pro oh, Bloodborne 2015. Yep, that's one of my favorites. Uh, Horizon Doom came Zero out in 2016. Dawn. I think that was 2018, 2019. Um, bum, 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 bum. It was Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I don't know if anyone here liked that. Oh, Journey. That was a really good game. Red Dead Redemption 2 was 2018. Witcher 3. Yes. That oh, there you go. Great. Yeah. Yeah, that was fantastic. Oh, and yep. GTA 5 was 2013. That's like a lot of people. Oh, Portal 2. Hell yeah. Oh, I love Red... Portal 2. Red Dead 2. That was 20... the 2010s, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Hey, Rocket League. <laughs> it was pretty kick ass. Oh, Fallout New Vegas was 2010 as well, by the way. A lot of people. Oh, picked okay. That. Yeah, yeah. And Outer Wilds was 2019. And that's recommended by basically everybody. So, yeah, there you go. There's a list. <laughs> yeah, go to war. Oh, I do love it. Yeah, we know. We know. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, yeah. Basically, we waited for chat to like name some games and then we we're like, oh, that was good. That was nice. Yeah, I like that. Um, Andrew Singh says, baggage claim in the house. Uh, hashtag Deces represent. Can you please ask the drinker and the gang to watch uh, Chak de India? Uh, it's one of the best Chucky. Indian films in my mind. Hollywood could learn a fair bit from it. Yeah, the it's called Chuck the India. It's about it's it's quite it's now like probably eight eight years old. Um, but I would recommend it's a good movie. But I would recommend a lot of other Indian movies to you guys if you're ever interested in watching kind of like the the best that the industry has to offer from the last ten years. Well, I'll be totally honest. Like, if uh, if Hollywood is run dry in terms of like just good narratives and stuff, like I would happily turn my attention elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. So, like, uh, I enjoyed Triple R. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's uh, things on that sort of uh, that trajectory mm -hmm. that would be good to watch. Because yeah. I, I would happily like watch them and like if they're good, like tell people about them. I'd rather people watch that than like watch garbage coming out of Marvel or, you know, DC or whatever. Right. I would say, you know, so a, a movie that you guys might enjoy is called Padmabhat. Um, and I will drop a link somewhere because I know it's kind of hard to spell, but it's, it's set in the 1300s and it's a very, it's a very highly produced film that really shows like the contrast of two different cultures clashing and like it's and it's embodied in two different men just like coming head to head but then there's all this it's it's great i won't give too much away let me stop talking okay no. sounds good i'll uh, i'll move on to the next super chat um Elsie Lapen says, uh, Good day, drinker, mauler, and guests. We've had major eras in movies such as westerns or superheroes. What do you see potentially being the next one and why? Did we kind of just accidentally answer that earlier? Or... <laughs> if... I, I mean, like, we we talk about games, but then games lead you into a whole bunch of different genres. Like, it could be action, it could be horror, it could be psychological thriller. You like... say that as if superheroes can't do all of those things. They just made you think they can't because they're well, all yeah, the yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they they fit the ball into a mold, but like, mm. I don't know. Like, I assume that like conventional like military thrillers might have a resurgence after superheroes. Because it feels like we've trended in that direction with things like the terminal list. 
uh, and Reacher, where it's like, you know, it's just kind of like action thriller type, you know, scenarios. I could be wrong on that one. It could be something totally different. Um, there's some. Um, there's a line between, I guess, like enduring and just continuing. There's still westerns that get released that are still pretty cool, right? And then there's still, as you just mentioned, with with that genre and all other ones, they still, they still. In, in fact, in you know, a hundred years from now, I'm sure they'll still be making superhero movies. There's gonna be one or two here and there, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, hopefully, they're good. <laughs> but uh, Kevin, yeah. Kevin Feige will be there like 120 years old. <laughs> and he's just like, ah, this is good. The next Marvel movie coming out. It's That's gonna thing. be great. Everybody's waiting for the superheroes to get off the throne now. It's like you guys, mm -hmm. you're annoying everyone. We've had yeah. enough. Yeah. Do you think that there's much room, much broad audience appetite for space opera, like big sci-fi, which hasn't been as big in the box office over the past 10 years? It's had its, it's, had its place taken. I mean, I know we had the, the Star Wars, the Disney Star Wars movies, but that's kind of its own thing. Um, but generally speaking, um, space opera and big sci-fi has not been a mainstay of box office for a long time. And maybe that can make a resurgence. <clears throat> I'll tell you one thing that you should keep an eye on. Very interesting. Have you heard of the three body problem? No. no. Mm, I think I you'll have. Be, you'll hear about this later this year. The two guys that made, um, that adapted Game of Thrones from the book, uh, Vice and what's, what are their names? Wait, you're talking about Dan and Dave and Dan? Dan and Dave? Yeah, and yeah. yeah. Those, yeah, two, yeah. those two guys, their next project, they're doing it with Netflix at the minute. They're adapting oh. a sci fi trilogy called The Three Body Problem. It's a, uh, Chinese sci-fi trilogy written by an author named Qi Jin Yu, and it's brilliant. It's it's my favorite sci-fi book of this century. It's that good, and I read a lot of sci-fi books. And the premise is, is excellent. This is the basic premise of it. So humanity discover that in uh, the, the our neighboring solar system, there is an intelligent species, but this intelligent species is aggressive, and they have sent an invasion force to attack Earth. It's going to take 200 years for that invasion force to arrive at the solar system. So humanity <laughs> has 200 years to prepare for this coming alien invasion. Hmm. It's absolutely brilliant. The novel's incredible. The Chinese were going to adopt it, but they, I think they ran out of money or something. Or they didn't have enough money. So Netflix got a hold of it and they brought in the guys from um, Game of Thrones to do it for them. So that'll be really interesting to see what happens there. Hmm. And uh, sorry, is it oh, set like contemporary? Uh, we it's know this not Contemporary, yeah. Okay. So the, the novel was written, I think the first one was published in 2010 or something like that, 2007. I, I don't know the exact year, but it's basically contemporary. So they discover the existence of the aliens in the present. And um, it's a Chinese uh, uh, um, astronomer. And she uh, she's the one that discovers the fleet coming for Earth, and she manages to communicate with them. And then they figure out, okay, these guys are actually coming for us. But it's really good. It goes. It's not just like crazy sci-fi. It goes into a lot of human psychology, for example... I don't know if you're familiar with it. Do you know Extinction Rebellion? Are you familiar with that group? Mm -hmm. There's a kind of group like Extinction Rebellion who want humanity to be wiped out because they think humanity are bad for the planet and they try to sabotage the human efforts and everything. It's uh, it's really good. Really, really cool. So I'm, that's probably one of the things I'm anticipating most this year. And if that is a major success on Netflix, maybe that will bring back big sci-fi, big space opera and, and herald more adaptations. But of course, uh, we've also got June Part 2. We'll see how that does as well. Yeah. Like, the three the body novel, problem. The three body problem. I, I would strongly recommend the novel. It's brilliant. Yeah, mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, the next one is um, Blue Balls Spare says, "Hi guys and gals, I've got two questions for you. Drinker, have you heard anything about the Highlander remake and what's happening with your own film? Go ahead and show for yourself." Um, the the last thing I heard about the Highlander remake, they were gonna cast they were gonna cast uh, Henry Cavill in it. Um, not heard anything more about his production status. It seems to have like you know gone into development hell. Uh, as for my own movie, yeah, it's not in development hell at all. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's doing great. Uh, we have got the, the the slightly thorny problem of we've got a budget, we've got a script, and we've got to try and marry those two things up. So we've got to make the budget fit with what we were trying to do. So. Uh, that's what we're currently working on right now. It's it's all good fun. Unfortunately, I don't have to be involved in it, so I can let the the director and the producers like hash that out between themselves, and uh, come up with like a, a finished plan for the movie. But uh, yeah, 
they're, they're on schedule to shoot in the summer of this year so that's all good stuff so i can't wait to see it happen um Stybeck B says, imagine that I watched the Tropic Thunder stream eight times. Please do scary movie <laughs> with Mauler and Az. Good times. Take care and keep up the good work. I am game. We should definitely do scary movie. That'd be awesome. Um, next one is Mark Colrevi says, evening all. Who is everyone's favorite film composer and what do you think is their best soundtrack? My favorite is James Horner and I think Mask of Zorro legends of the fall and braveheart are his best i was always a james horner man myself mm. so Hans Zimmer. that was actually something i saw in the comments that we didn't talk about enough and i feel bad was uh, the wrath of khan's soundtrack is really fucking good yeah <laughs> I haven't heard that. khan's theme is just so dangerous it's so like vicious love it is it too lame to say John Williams? I mean, I can't deny the man. <laughs> he's, he's made so many amazing soundtracks. Yeah, you can't, you can't deny it. No. Uh, I would Hans say. Zimmer and Interstellar, that's my favorite. I, I guess yeah, the question Inyo is like, do you judge them for their best mm -hmm. or do you judge them for their worst? Or do we just start naming all the ones we like? Yeah. <laughs> Raman Jinwadi, uh, he's fucking brilliant as well. Bear McCreary, some of his best stuff I love as well. Hmm. Yeah, Ennio Morricone, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Um, it's my, probably my favorite soundtrack. Yep. You can't argue with that one either. Was the, when it comes was the to iconic eight, theme tunes. Was The Hateful Eight the last one he did? Um, or did he just do a song for that? I can't remember. I don't know. He's very old now. So oh, I, yeah, I, don't I thought he died. It. Is he still alive? Is he dead? Yeah, because I, I think I remember thinking, like, oh, he got to... Uh, Quentin Tarantino got him to make a song for... Hang on, let me yeah, check. <laughs> Is he still alive? Yeah, he died in 2020. He died in 2020. Okay. That's sad. Yeah, no, because he's a legend. Um, yeah, and uh, another really great one he did was um, The Mission. That was a really beautiful soundtrack. I've heard that. That's great. And Very oh, good. Lord of the Rings. Best soundtrack ever. Oh, Howard Shaw, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just for the Lord of the Rings, you could pick him as your favorite, to be honest with you. Oh, so good. What's your, what do you think about Bear McCreary? I really... He's super hit and miss because stuff like Rings of Power, but then there's Ragnarok uh, that I thought was fantastic, so it's it's complicated. Did, did you ever hear his work on Battlestar Galactica? I yeah, it was brilliant. Not. I think that might, where, that might be where he got his start. I don't remember him doing anything before that, but that. Do you think a composer the... needs something really good, like emotionally, to work off? Because with, with Battlestar Galactica, you get, which is an excellent soundtrack, you get that from Bear McCreary, and then Rings of Power, and you know, you <laughs> He's can't really get ahead I, in that. I, I, yeah, I mean, I think with anything, like with Rings of Power, it's like, well, if you if I don't have a strong sense of like what the story is, if I don't have a strong sense of what my emotional connection is to these mm -hmm. characters i'm just going to produce you a generic fantasy soundtrack he's yeah gonna... i think any good composer can produce something like that but it's like yeah you want some connection to it it's got to be it's got to be visceral it's got to produce that gut gut reaction in you he made a big blog post about how when you're struggling with ragnarok you'd always return to the story the script to get inspiration for the music we all know very well we don't have to pretend like there is no inspiration to draw from rings of power as a script there's nothing you can do so yeah. you just have to make music that sounds kind of like music i guess <laughs> there you go. i mean what is uh what is um uh, what's her name galadriel's theme mm. no you know what idea. i mean like psychotic orchestra <laughs> just dissonant phrase and chords <laughs> to reflect the insanity of this woman's mind who wants to go out oh and, and cause chaos in the world and, and <laughs> pursue a war for 200 years like how do you reflect that musically is it just like Bartok Bartok in his most extreme modernist form <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah it's terrifying stuff uh, yeah. the next one is from Hornsey who gave me 50 pounds so thank you very much um, Labor Kambal says, Mauler and Guess, what's your gin pick? If you had to, if you had to pick a gin to drink, what would it be? I'm not familiar with gins as much as, I don't think I've drank oh, many you gins. You pleb! 
I'm you so sorry. Welshman. Hey, I had the Ryan Reynolds gin, the aviation one. Did you? I've had that before, actually. I didn't didn't love it. Yeah, it's meh. I, I <laughs> the thing is, when you when you start mixing gin with tonic, like a lot of them f taste fairly similar. It's like when you mix a bourbon with Coke. It's you know you lose some of the flavor with that. Um, I tend to my, rank whiskey and rum above gin. My my top gins would be Whitley Neal. Like I think they produce fantastic gins and uh, Tankery. Like orange Tankery gin is uh, perfect on a hot summer's day. That's exactly what you need. Um, XSL says better time. Well, I mean, you know, we we started as quickly as we could. What can I say? Mm -hmm. uh, Duradane Dude says, Hail Drinker, do you think it would be possible to get Living Jar Cletus on sometime? He's a smaller YouTuber, so it could give him a bit of a boost. I mean, I can try. You know, that's uh, we're all about giving people like chances here and uh, and bringing them on, giving them a bit of exposure. Um, Blue Collar Loser says, Excellent video on the whale. Great timing with Brendan winning the Oscar. I'll catch the replay. Watching, uh, sorry, walking in now to see Shazam 2. Pray for me. I, <laughs> I, I do pray for you, sir. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I feel really bad that I didn't see the whale sooner. I just never quite got around to it. And uh, I finally had some time uh, a couple of days ago and watched it and just, yeah, very much enjoyed it. As soon it. as um, they said he was up for an Oscar for it or even other rewards, I was like, are we doing this just because we like him or are we doing this because mm. he did good? That's Th why I wanted to see is, it. Yeah, I mean, this is the problem. Like, I didn't want it to just be like, oh, well, this movie's popular now because he won an Oscar, so I should review it. Like, it was just timing, unfortunately you know well yeah and just um, did he deserve it you know and it's nice to know i think he earned it instead of it just yeah. being we like him let's give him an oscar i i'm i'm really happy that he won best actor for this movie but the movie didn't win best picture it, you know I, it I mean. wasn't like uh, i think that that's yeah. probably what i would have picked like i wouldn't have nominated this movie for best picture but i think he his performance deserved an oscar or at least consideration for one i i agree yeah, I don't think it was the, no. the one of the better movies of last year, but the performance is amazing. I think you, I, I did watch your video on it. I think you said that this is a movie which very much rests on the performance of the central actor. If, yeah. if yeah. they got the wrong actor in there, did anybody yeah. see Tom Hanks and Elvis? Anybody? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, okay, by the way. That, that's a fat suit done wrong. That's prosthetics done wrong. And I just, mm. it's, it's got this weird it's uncanny distracting. alley thing going on. And I can't get away of, from um, it. It looks like Tom Hanks playing a badly in this weird suit this weird prosthetic suit but I think if you had that kind of thing going on it, it would have been a disaster that movie but with the right performance it was really good yeah. but on the note whether or not it should have been nominated for best picture there are plenty of things that shouldn't have it's been better than, it's better, better than avatar better than they nominated it's better than avatar Just no doubt about that yeah but hey you know that's the way it goes sometimes um Listen, I'm very conscious that, uh, you know, we've been going for almost three hours. Uh, I know Mauler's kind of on a bit of a time limit here because he's got other stuff to do. Um, <laughs> probably makes sense to finish up there. Because, you know, Mauler, you're the one that's the, always the killjoy. God damn it. <laughs> Chat, I told Riga to blame me if he wants to ditch you guys, all right? That's I, I always, yeah, I always do. It's like, I'm just sick of this. I hate it! <laughs> I hate talking to people. Uh, no, but, uh, I, like, Genuinely speaking, um, baggage claim, despot. Thank you guys for coming on for this tonight. Like it's been great to have you here, baggage claim. It's been great to have you back on again. Thank um, you. It's been a while since we had you, and I really appreciate you doing it, despot. Hope you've you've enjoyed your time on here. Um, but it's been great to have you on as well. Uh, this is yeah, your first time on Open me. Bar, so. Yeah, and I yeah. will uh, say that good to meet you both. I, have I been on a stream with baggage claim before? I can't remember. You have, yeah, yes. once with Nerdrotic and. Ah, oh, I, I was going to say you feel familiar in the yeah. best of ways, but yeah, it was a pleasure streaming with both of yous. Drink it, yeah. uh, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> I tolerate you. Fairly indifferent towards you at this point. <laughs> <laughs> you're just sort of there in the bar yeah. in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you, like for everyone that uh, has been generous enough to send us super chats, and uh, for everyone in chat as well. 
you know, thank you guys. If there's any super chats that we haven't quite got to tonight, we will, all, as always, catch up with them on a catch up stream. Uh, so don't worry about that. And uh, yeah, thank you to our mods as well for doing the, the usual fantastic job that they always do. So very much appreciated. Um, and I think we'll, we'll sign off with that. So that is all we've got for today. So go away now. Bye.